I'm Ethan Johnson, and this is uh, the battle or the siege of Bastogne collaborative display we made, um, replicating the town and the battle uh, that took place outside the town. Um, so if we just kind of work from this end and move our way down. Yeah. So here we have the church, which was used as a hospital, uh, the aid station, and the surrounding buildings been bombed out and things like that. Uh, jeep with uh, stretchers on it bringing the wounded in civilians around the city trying to make life as it normally was and then as we come down this way uh, we have a large hotel being bombed out and more shops and buildings um, and then in the center of the city here um, we have the park and uh, lots of things going on. We have vehicles parked here, watch spotlights, mortars, just lots of things going on. Um, Greg here made a lot of the park and the, this row of buildings here did a really good job with that. Excellent job. Hi, I'm Greg, sir. I did some of these houses right here and uh, I did over half the park and I also built that house in a few hours at the convention with the bulk parts. Okay. So when you're working on some of these houses, I like how you've incorporated kind of the snow with the roofs and then bombed out. What's some of your techniques and pieces that you use there to kind of get that all looked like that? Definitely a lot of tiles to make it look like it's fresh and no one really touched it. Okay. And um, also using a lot of pieces like these right here uh, to hang over the edges and stuff, it gets a great effect. A little tooth type piece. Yep. Gotcha, very cool. Keep moving down here. Yeah, and one more thing while we're in the park area. This building here across the, uh, from the park at this intersection is based on the actual town hall of Bastogne, and Elliot did a oh, yeah. great job building this using lots of nice architecture features. Yeah, it was a, a fun one. A little bit of last minute build, but I thought it came out pretty well. Um, I had a reference picture of the real thing, and I'm sure Ethan could show it. You could put it up as B-roll if you wanted to, but um, it's a little little uh, non-purist, which some people are kind of triggered by, but <laughs> but I, you can see I put like the stickers around it to kind of smooth out the snow, like make the transition smoother, and then I put some um, stickers on the windows to get the nice cross paneling. And then another thing I was really proud about that was the doors specifically. To get that like subtle indent, like I mean you can't really show it, but like if you take those doors out, they go like really deep to get all that like snot work in to get the subtle paneling. Yeah, so the studs not on top, kind of sideways building stuff there. Yeah, yep, yeah, snot, studs not on top. Just in case you didn't know, yeah, that's what it means. Perfect. Well, we'll keep moving down through the city then. Okay, so right outside the city we have the city walls and uh, a tent here with a map and a radio so they can communicate with the troops outside. And uh, you can see there's some remaining tracks where a jeep came through and um, the Americans in their foxholes hiding behind the sheds as the Germans advance towards the city. Um, the real battle is really a miracle how the Americans held it against so much uh, opposition, but uh, it was an American victory holding the town at the crossroads. Um, as you come in, uh, see the trees and the forest, the Americans digging in, and the Germans uh, attacking them. Down here at the end, we kind of have the German forces just on the, the edge of the build. Yeah, we have the German forces here dug in with uh, field artillery, the tanks advancing across the bridge, down the road, uh, power lines going into the city with telephone lines. Trying to and, get into the town. Yeah. Uh, last minute farmhouse. We built this on site. I like it. For last minute, it looks very good. Yeah, we were uh, up late last night finishing it. So, <laughs> so this build, collaborative build, is so massive. Do you know how long the whole thing is? Um, the original plan was 25 feet. We ended up shortening it a little bit. Uh, so somewhere around 20 to 25 feet. Okay. Yeah, that's amazing. How many total builders participated? Um, nine. 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 Yeah. Very cool. So as you were kind of collaborating on it, how did you all keep in touch and figure out who was doing what with the build? Uh, we used Skype and uh, I designed the layout in a grid section and posted standards so we knew our plates would all line up. 
Um, we had a reference group for uh, references for the French architecture style, snow techniques, tree techniques, all kinds of things, so we yeah. coordinated all of that. It worked out well because a lot of us worked on St. Mare last year, which was the one with the big church and the parachutes. So we kind of took our experiences from that and kind of used it to sort of work on this, which is um, why I think overall the French architecture is definitely better this year than it was last year because we had a year of experience to kind of develop it more and kind of get better at it. So I think that definitely helped. Yeah, that's really cool. You get more experience with that. One thing I noticed, I want to make sure we can maybe go back and touch on, is the, the air aerial stuff yes. here. Yes. So you've got the plane and the parachutes. Talk about that. Yeah, we actually had uh, Yasser, a uh, friend of mine, yeah. uh, design it. Um, I uh, messaged him on Flickr to see if he could make us a plane, and he uh, did an amazing job making that. Uh, sent me the LDD file to make a second one. Unfortunately, he didn't have time to make a second one, but... Uh, we used the planet pieces for the parachutes, and uh, I think it adds a lot to the mock. And so that's the parachutes are kind of supply drops into the Americans in the town? Right, yes. Okay. So, very, yeah, I think that, that works perfect. And you guys got like string kind of holding that stuff yeah. up as it comes down? Yep. Yeah. That was all stuff we learned from Mayor last year where we had a lot of trial and error to see how we could get the parachutes. Um, and we found that last year, this sort of thing where you kind of just take them down you can take them anywhere you want and then just attach them was probably the best technique for it yeah. well very impressive so how long how long ago did you guys start working on this about how much time roughly did this take for all of you um i actually started designing the church the week after brick fair last year okay. so that was the first thing i did and i planned the layout and um last year my mock was a solo mock the battle of new Yuen, and um Elliot uh, messaged me to see if the St. Mayor crew could help me out with this because they didn't have a collab, so we came up with this. Yeah, it all worked out well because um, the St. Mayor group, like half the people kind of like couldn't come to Brick Fair again this year, so it, it worked out well to, to join up with Ethan and do a new group on a work on a collab together. And how big of kind of base plate sections is most of this building? Uh, this, most of the town is built on 48 by 48 stud base plates, the large gray ones. And then the snow is made of the uh, 32 by 32 uh, green base plates. And t talk about the minifigs, because you've got a lot of different minifigs mixed all in throughout here. Uh, kind of what, how'd you customize those to look like the World War II figs? Uh, we had uh, MMCB make the coats for us. They're actually cloth coats that go over the minifigures. And then uh, the Minifig Co. custom designed legs for us that have snow on the boots. So we used all of those. And then mixed in civilians and other things like that to add to the effect. As far as like accessories and weapons go, it's all brick arms mostly. With a few like things here and there that might be a bit different, but those are the main ones. And are the vehicles uh, mostly custom or kits? How did you decide to do that? Uh, all the vehicles are actually my design uh, in old dark gray. The old gray before they transitioned in 2003. So um, they're 140th scale. A little harder to get that 145th with the older parts. No cheese slopes or not many tiles, so. Yeah, that's very cool. And I think I noticed that a lot of the buildings here have kind of custom sort of decals or stickers yeah. and stuff on there. So if you want to point out some of those on, on some yeah. of the buildings along here? Yeah, um, we actually just researched uh, authentic posters and advertisements from the era and surrounding um, time periods like early 30s, late 30s, 40s and printed them out on sticker paper or regular printer paper and glued or stick, stuck them on. I think it adds like a nice, like just to break up empty walls, especially it's very easy to do too, but it, it looks really nice and I think it adds a lot to the authenticity of the mock. I agree, yeah, you stick it on the buildings in it and it looks really nice. So yeah, this, I think the whole collaboration turned out amazing. I love what you've done here. You captured the whole town and the invading army and everything really well. So I appreciate you guys putting all your time into this and talking with me about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
I'm joined by Dan Siskin from Brickmania, and he's going to take us through this massive D-Day layout here uh, for you know some longer-term viewers of Beyond the Brick. You might recognize something we covered a couple of years ago that had uh, a similar layout, but uh, Dan switched up the ships and things here, and there's some some new details and everything. So if you want to take us through the whole layout then? Sure, yeah. The last, the previous version of this, I think it had the LST in it. Mm -hmm. So the LST was actually donated to LST 325. We, we, we actually built, turned, converted it into their ship. So... We wanted to preserve the D-Day diorama, and this is actually what we wanted to do from the get-go, depicting it as it was on June 6, 1944. So this is like the initial waves of the Americans and allies hitting Omaha Beach. So we shortened the amount of water, because we don't have that gigantic ship in the way anymore, and we ex extended the beach. The diorama is exactly the same size. There's just a lot more of it now. Okay. So a lot more land. So what you see out in the water here, these are landing craft. The big ones are landing LCTs. They're landing... Uh, well, the one the camera's on now, that's LCM, Landing Craft Mechanical. Basically, one Sherman tank would fit in there. Uh, they didn't like to do that because it's so heavy that it almost waterlogs the boat. Uh, we did get a, a nice donation of brick arm shells. So, <laughs> as you see, it is completely full of shells. There's definitely no smoking allowed on that boat, but they're firing their guns anyway. Um, the bigger craft, the, these are LCTs. They're landing, they're, it's, a, it's a landing craft that can hold up to five Sherman tanks. Uh, for the sake of this diorama, we only have two on each. On each, um, I think we've pilfered tanks off of these for other other dioramas. <laughs> so in the water, you have we have two of these. One that that old one in the back that the cameras on right now. That's old gray. So that's that thing's been around for all, quite a long time. One of my older models, and then Cody built a newer version of it in front here. Um, his is new gray. Uh, he probably had a better better use of parts than I did. Anyway. <laughs> you just struggle with what was available back then. Yeah, that was built years and years ago before before Brick Mania was really as big as it was, and I, and I, my budget was a lot smaller. So that's a that's an old castle taken apart right there, <laughs> for sure. So we have all the lit, the lit up landing craft uh, in the water. The the machine guns are actually it's a lighting effect from brick stuff. These are I believe older older. Uh, Machine gun effects boards, they, they kind of flash an awful lot, so it looks like they, those machine guns would be overheating <laughs> by now at this no, point. No, but it adds a great kind of popping effect. So do you, is that kind of difficult to add into these, or talk about kind of logistics of adding lights in like that to so many of these kind of builds? The lights aren't, aren't they're, they're really not difficult. The brick stuff lights, uh, the only drawback about them, it's actually a kind of a blessing and a curse. The wires are very thin, and they're very delicate, so you can easily break the wires. Oh, okay. On the other hand, they're really easy to conceal. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> Like it's it's two sides of the same coin. We're traveling a lot. We tend to like stuff gets banged around. If you're building at home, you're probably you, a little more intense with the models than most builders would be. Right, and and a lot of hands because you know when when Brick Mania sets up a huge display like this, it's not just me putting it together. If I was to set this up by myself, it would be like two eight hour days. So two, I think we we figured out this particular diorama. Two people takes eight hours to set up. Four people can do it in four hours and. It's 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 just a hugely you know time consuming process, and when you have that many hands in it, there's definitely like different people are gonna do stuff differently, and they may not know the whole system of how the lights were, how fragile things are. So uh, we've learned by experience to bring extra spares, with <laughs> <laughs> lights and stuff like that. But if you're doing it at home and you know exactly the whole system, you, the lights are easy. Everything's easy to work. And that's with. why you do things like that, you know, the parts dumping with the water, because obviously that saves time. If you go back and look at your old videos, I'm sure you can see that the blue, the water's blue, and we we used to do a lot more with the wakes, and 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 like oh, we're now we're like oh, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> we've given up. Mm -hmm. So um, we've we've spent many days, many hours sorting sorting water <laughs> back to its original base colors. So here we have one of the one of the landing craft took a took a direct hit from the Germans and. There's there's a an awful lot of blood in the water here, but that's kind of the way it was. And mm -hmm. so we we usually limit ourselves to sort of PG displays, but this time we were like, okay, well, well, this is this is probably the last time this diorama. Actually, I can tell you right now, this is the last time this will be viewed by the public. So we are building an aircraft carrier, and this will all become part of the aircraft carrier. <laughs> so everything that's gray you see here will be part of the aircraft carrier. Even the tan, even the beach will be mm -hmm. inside somewhere. So. And then we've got this crazy box looking thing going here. So talk about what that is for so, people who might not be familiar with that. Actually, to start with that, you can look at the one on the ground here. So it's the same thing. So this is a Sherman tank and that dark tan thing that that ring around it is what they call a it's it's like a waiting. It's like basically a a, a canvas boat that wraps around the the tank. They drop the skirts down, raise up the sides 
And then you end up with something that looks like this in the water. It's basically a flotation device for a Sherman tank. Mm -hmm. And just the air inside of that is enough buoyancy to keep that Sherman tank from sinking. And the guys were way down inside of it. They'd have to stand up on the roof. And you can see them bailing water out of it in there, too. But they'd have to stand up on the roof of the tank and yell down orders like, go left, go right. So they swam these tanks ashore. It's a duplex drive. The one on the shore here, you can see the little propellers. Let me, let me uh, turn it. You'll be able to see the little propellers. Duplex drive because there's two, two, two propellers sticking out of the back of the thing. It crawled through the water like three miles an hour or something. So these were supposed to hit the beach first, the first wave of D-Day. And it took them so long to get to shore that the infantry actually beat them to shore. Oh, yeah. And some of them just sank outright. Like you can see those guys bailing water out of that <laughs> it one. It seemed like a fun job there. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, the Americans, because the Americans landed on Omaha Beach, um, on Omaha Beach, I think they lost about half of them to being swamped by the waves. Uh, the, the British were luckier. They, they landed on a more sheltered beach. They didn't, they didn't have that problem. Mm -hmm. so. so then as we come ashore here, what do we have? You have the infantry. So the, they, the Americans landed during low tide. The Allies, not just the Americans, landed on low tide. As you can see, these are the obstacles. These, these are like basically like t t obstacles just, just designed to destroy landing ships. So you have these wooden, you know, they're gigantic, sharp wooden objects sitting in the water covered with mines. So if a ship came and landed at high tide, it would basically hit these mines and blow up. And you know, if you have a, a, a ship full of troops, that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So the, Amer the Allies decided they would land at high tide or low tide, so the water's way out here. Unfortunately, it means that also there's this huge expanse of beach between the water and um, the, the, the waiting Germans on the other mm -hmm. side. So this is just basically a killing zone. So all the, all the Americans had to wade through the water all the way across the beach um, before they could even get to within range of, uh, you know, possibility of even fighting the, the, the Germans, let alone getting up off the beach. So um, you have a lot of guys running through the open expanse. Um, engineers came through and blew up all these, all these mines and stuff. But this is how it was before the beach was secured. Yeah, and you can just see, you know, there would have been a lot of this open space and everything, like you said, there's there's not a lot to protect yourself. Right, yeah, it took a lot of guts to run across, but if you stayed in one place, you'd be, you're just, you're actually more likely to get shot by not moving because you just present yourself as a target. So mm -hmm. so this is a lot of minifigures, <laughs> as you can see. These are all old Brick Mania figures that, that we, you know, uh, pilfered from our own stash to, to, to make this, this beach scene, so... Mm -hmm. And then what are some of the obstacles we have as you get closer up here? Yeah, so these are designed to destroy, these, these out here, these are designed to destroy ships. As you get closer to shore, these black things are anti-tank obstacles. So they're called like tetrahedrons, tetrahedrons uh, was one name. Um, they have a, they're basically tank traps. Um, so the infantry could get past them, obviously, but the, the tanks would get hung up on them. They, they wouldn't be able to get past them. So engineers had to either come and bulldoze them out of the way or blow them up and... Uh, as you get closer to the shore, the the Germans had they had this whole there's a, basically a sand berm like a hill with barbed wire running across the top. If you wanted to get through it, you'd have, basically you get you know, the idea was that you'd have to run up to the barbed wire, try to climb over it, and then you're an easy target for the for the guys waiting up on the hill. Mm -hmm. So um, these guys are trying to blow a hole through the 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 uh, barbed wire so they could get through. I mean, this is this is what really happened on D-Day. So. Um, I don't know about the Captain America part. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard he was there. It depends on which history book you're reading. Right. So these guys are they are basically stuck at the sand berm. You know, the next phase would be them, you know, uh, they actually had to, like, get through the barbed wire, get up into the into the top of the uh, um, the hills here, and take out the Germans in any way they could. So at the point in this battle, right now, the Americans haven't gotten through the front, but you have some guys up on top. You have some paratroopers up on top that did manage to make it up there. Again, I don't know about the the uh, Wonder Woman part, but I, I heard she was there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you even got kind of trenches in the in the built yeah, into the cliff. The, the whole the the cliff. This is this is Omaha Beach, and the cliffs above Omaha Beach were heavily fortified. So the Germans had built bunkers into the into the into the into the cliff face. Gigantic naval guns. Um, some of the guns aren't. Some of the electric lights aren't exactly working right now. And quite frankly, since we're tearing this apart next week, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I won't. There's only so much you're putting into it. Right, right. So it's traveled around quite a bit. Um, I'm looking for, you know, I, I look at this and I'm like, oh, I want all these bricks because mm -hmm. below the surface here is just, it's just, you know, two by four bricks. It's like, it's like builder's gold. <laughs> that, that'll be the, the inside of whatever, you know, next big ship you're doing. It'll be an aircraft carrier. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll spill the beans right now. There you go. <laughs>
Yeah, so how, how long is this whole thing, do you know? Right, what you're looking at right now is 24 feet. Okay. We've made this thing as long as 30 feet in the past. Depends on where we go, what we have for table space and what we're putting on it. So this is this is about average. Usually it's about 24 feet. Mm -hmm. Do you try to build pretty much most of your displays to kind of be flexible like that? Because obviously you're taking it to different size shows and everything, so it needs to be able to move around and then be able to set up at different sizes. Well, we typically would build to uh, table size. So standard, uh, standard banquet tables are... 30 inches deep by eight feet long for, and so we build to that. Um, our own tables that we buy are 30 by 60 and we try to make it so we can shift around. You know, that's perfect for Lego base plates. Okay. Uh, four Lego base plates equals 60 inches wide and two, two Lego base plates deep is 30 inches wide. So uh, it's a standard banquet table that work really well with Lego. So, um, so that this one is one of the few ones that we can actually customize in length because the water is just any length that we want to make it. The shore is the shore is 12 feet. And we can't do anything about that because it just gently slopes all the way down. But we do. I mean, especially some of the other displays that don't have fixed boundaries, we can make them any size we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm sure that's nice as you guys go to so many shows over the years and all different areas setting up. Yeah, you never know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So we bring our own tables sometimes. If we don't have room, we rely on what what the 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 destination location has or for like at a, at a convention or something. Sometimes the tables are just weird sizes and, and we do, we make, we make do. We've actually gone to TV studios to set up stuff and they did, they're like, Oh, we were supposed to bring it half tables for you. And like, so we've had to improvise. Uh, we've done we've done stuff on bar stools. We've done, you know, you name it, we've done it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, nice. Well, I'm glad we we're able to capture this one last time before you tear this apart for the next big aircraft yeah. carrier build. Yeah. This, this, this is a fun one, but yeah, it's, it's time to go. We'll do another D-Day, some tie-in next year. Mm -hmm. For sure, we'll look forward to it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrew Spangler, and this is my build Itter Castle. And basically, I started off, I wanted to make a castle and have it be related to World War II. And so I searched, and there's only a few castles that actually participated in World War II, and this is one of them. It's actually one of the most interesting because the French, Germans, and Americans all fought alongside each other against the SS. So here you can basically see the SS are all, all along the sides fighting the defenders on the inside. And Interesting. So if you can give some more, I guess, of that backstory and why the French, Germans, and Americans ended up together fighting against other Germans. So the castle is in Tyrol, Austria. So right when World War II broke out, the Germans invaded all the surrounding countries, so they took over the, the castle, and then they took all the French high-up officials, VIPs, and then they were held in the castle. And then towards the end of the war, it was about four or some days before the war actually ended, a French Olympic tennis player escaped from the castle, and then the other prisoners they told him, go find an American battalion. They ended up running into a German battalion, but they wanted to surrender. So they both ended up going and finding a, an American battalion. And then the, the Germans, to prove, that, well, prove their surrender, make themselves look a little bit better, they offered their services to the, to the Americans and French. So they all came back. There was only a few guards and such, so they took over the castle pretty easily. But then a uh, SS battalion ended up coming to try to retake the castle. And so the battle basically took place, I think it was three days before the war completely ended. So the SS would have been these more hardcore German troops that didn't want to surrender and they were going to like the last man at the end of the war? Yeah, the, the fanatics, okay. the ones Hitler completely brainwashed and stuff. Well, very interesting. So if you can take us through some more of the build then. One thing I noticed is the great minifigs. Do you want to talk about kind of the designs, those, and where that came from? So the minifigures are pretty much all custom. I took Roglin's decals. I decaled basically all. I think there's only one uh, pr br Brickmania printed figure. All the other ones are decaled. And then all the brick arms are painted. I tried to paint all the, the brick arms vests as well. And then a few of the, the minifigures are, they have the decal underneath and then I painted on top of that. So that's, those are more of the SS, the ones that are, have the most paint on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they turned out really great. And then the castle itself here and kind of the bridge, if you can talk about some of your techniques with that, there's a lot of little details in there. I, uh, I tried to, I've had these three specific techniques or pieces that I used. I used the 
masonry bricks, then the one by one studs mixed with the two or one by two plates made a one by three brick with out of those. And then I used the one by one with the, the stud on the side and then some tiles. And I just basically or also with a few other things like one by one round bricks and I took all those pieces and then I stuck with those and throughout the the whole castle I just used those those pieces to give it that more detailed look. And as you were working on this, uh, what kind of like sources and inspiration did you use? Like photos of the castle? Does the castle still exist today? Yeah, the castle still does exist. It's a private castle, so there's not quite as ma many pictures as I would have liked. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the pictures were only of the front up view of the castle, so I think that's what I got the most accurate. So I, I basically mainly went off pictures. So I, I think I got the front of it pretty good off of pictures. The back was more just trying to make sure it matched the front, and yeah. Yeah. What's the interior like, sort of the structure inside there? Oh, the structure inside, it's completely hollow. The, the main keep itself, that has the most supports on. It's got a lot of filler brick on the inside, and then the other ones have some supports, but they're mainly leaning into each other or into, onto the, the main keep. Yeah, well, very good. I think the build turned out really nice. Another thing you've got is some really good kind of landscaping and trees. Can you talk about kind of the, your hill technique and the tree technique? Well, I actually, I started off, I did most of the landscaping, partly because I didn't want to, I was un, kind of unsure about the castle, so I was doing more familiar grounds, doing the landscaping. So I did a lot of that first. It, so the outside is pretty much just basic one stud high plus a plate or one, not one stud, one brick high with a plate on top. And then we'll go, uh, as it goes in, there's basically just some, some plating with columns underneath. So, and then I slowly just had that step up in about a brick high each going up. And then after that, uh, there's a lot of just different colors underneath. And then I started covering those up with the, the color plating and then evened it out on the top. And yeah. so the top is pretty much just covered and underneath are just columns underneath. It worked out very nice. So for people who are interested, how did the story end? What could have happened to the defenders and the attacking Germans? Well, so the battle went on. The Americans and French and Germans, they ended up starting to lose, but they sent for reinforcements and since it was basically the end of the war, three days after it, the war ended, okay. uh, and another American battalion came in and basically just got the SS to leave or mm -hmm. defeated them. So the Americans, Germans, French, they did end up winning the battle. Well, there you go. I think it's an amazing build and I love the story behind it. It's really interesting. Kind of one of those small episodes from World War II that's it's fascinating to study. So thank you. I appreciate you bringing this build to Brick World. My name is Paul Thomas. I'm from Southern California and this is my uh, 1941 U.S. Uh, Army tank uh, arsenal or factory. Uh, it's based on the Chrysler uh, tank factory from that time frame and uh, this particular factory uh, produced um, Sherman tanks during World War II and uh, produced about a third of the 89,000 Sherman tanks that were produced during the uh, war for the Allied forces. Mm -hmm. So that's very impressive. So this is all based on a real building then? The concept is based on the real building. The real building is designed quite a bit different and obviously quite a bit larger too. Uh, they started construction on the building in uh, 1939 and we're rolling out M3 uh, tanks before the building was even done. Uh, and they were going over to Allied forces and US forces. They quickly switched over to the Sherman when they realized that the uh, M3 was not a very good tank. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, let's kind of take us through each section of the building here and kind of show us what you've got in there. Sure, so uh, essentially in this building, we've got uh, three production lines going. They're all uh, different phases of the tank, starting with the uh, main hole piece down at the far end, and then working its way through the production line uh, as they add components to it, and then roll, obviously, the completed tank out the back door and then over to here. Um, on this side here, they're waiting for transport. 
uh, to be put on uh, train cars and moved to uh, uh, spots where they would uh, be assigned to units and then shipped over to uh, the war zone wherever they were being being sent. So we've got guys out here that are uh, adding machine guns and ammo as they uh, prepare to uh, be put on the tanks or be prepared to put on the trains and uh, rolled out to, uh, to the field. And then another part of the factory, we've got uh, a lot of equipment, um, milling equipment to make different parts. This factory uh, actually made a majority of the parts on site uh, during the war. So they would produce the parts, they'd move them over to the production line and uh, stick them on the tanks. Yeah, so. that's incredible. So as you were working on this, were you looking at photos uh, then of the, of the original building that it kind of inspired this? Yeah, yeah, like all my builds, I do quite a bit of research into them, get an idea of what they're like. Obviously, there are limitations with Legos, so, you know, you uh, do the best you can in terms of uh, trying to reproduce or, or come up with the same concept that uh, the way it was done. And uh, so, yeah, did a lot of research, looked a lot of pictures online, uh, found a lot of great information available, obviously, uh, through Google. <laughs> And then talk about the roof structure a little bit there, because it's interesting to see how you've kind of replicated that throughout the building. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure that uh, I had a lot of light inside. That way uh, it'll be much easier to see uh, the different aspects of the, uh, the build. So I wanted to make sure I had a, a good girder system to uh, attach lights to, uh, string the cabling and so forth. And uh, it came out nice. I probably should have done a little less so people would have a better access or viewing to it, but uh, it is what it is, and uh, it I, I like the design and how it came out. So, mm -hmm. And when you bring this to a show like Brick World, does it all stay together, or can that roof parts come off and then the walls kind of come down and uh, move it a little easier? Yeah, so we compacted it down as much as possible. This particular layout breaks down to three 30 by 60 inch tables. The center 30 by 60 inch table stays together for the most part. And uh, the two end pieces, we strip down all the sand green panels, which are just panels. So you just pull them off, and uh, that way it compacts it down a little bit more and uh, goes into the transport crate. Mm -hmm. So it takes about three and a half hours to put together once we're on site. That's, that's not too bad, you know, it, it could be worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, three and a half hours uh, for a setup is a little longer than I'm used to, but uh, yeah, not too bad. Not too then bad. I noticed some of the minifigs around you, like this great scene of the, the guys getting their photograph taken there. So uh, what kind of parts did you use for that? How did those come together? Those were, uh, those were custom minifigs. Uh, most of them, I think those ones are from Brick Mania. We've got a uh, Patton figure there, and then of course some other uh, uh, commanders, tank commanders, uh, that would have been visiting the factory and uh, checking out the product as it rolled off the line. Yeah, so. well it's a, it's a great display here. I always love seeing these like historically based buildings, so thanks so much for bringing it to the show. Well, thanks for stopping by, and good to see you guys again.
we are going to take a look at the USS Missouri battleship here. Now, longtime viewers of Beyond the Brick will remember that we covered this way back when Dan was first starting work on this. This is a 25 and a half foot model of the USS Missouri. It's, it's built in 135th scale, uh, a common scale I, I build in. I do a lot of military modeling. It's three months into the project. And then I've given some updates over the years, so we wanted to give kind of a final update here because I think it's about as finished as it's ever going to get, right, Dan? Right, right. It's, it's, it's probably had higher states of being finished, but every time we travel, some parts fall off. It needs a little bit of repairs, and this is sort of the state that it's, it's probably going to be in for the rest of the duration, unless we can get it permanently installed somewhere, and I don't have to keep repairing it. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> Sounds good. Well, then, if you want to take us through the ship here and kind of how it's set up right now. Sure. Well, right now, I mean, you on this side of it, everybody, you'll notice everybody's in their dress white uniforms. So it's it's set up exactly how the ship was in uh, September 2nd, uh, 1945, when the Japanese uh, government representatives came aboard and signed the, basically the instrument of surrender uh, in Tokyo Bay, um, at, you know, ending World War II. So that, this is the way the ship was, and they all had, if you look at pictures, they were all, the, all the sailors were wearing, they, they called them undressed white uniforms. Um, and then they had all the brass, so you have all, the, all these officers down here. Um, they are like basically representatives of all the Allied powers. You, know, you have all the, jet, the admirals and generals involved. So MacArthur was there, Nimitz, Halsey, um, basically everybody who had a hand in the defeat of the Japanese Empire uh, was aboard the ship that day. Mm-hmm. So. Fantastic. So that's a ton of minifigs then. So what, what else do we have in the ship here? Sure. Well, you, you will see this is actually turned around. If this, typically this is set up on the other side. You'll see the guys in the dress blues, or that the, 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 the blue dungarees. This is like an actual work uniform with their like life jackets on. This is how the other side of the ship would be you know, on display. So the other side, you'll see how it was when they were in a combat situation. So we have all these guys. Brick Arms actually made us some special shells for... Um, you know, that we can put in our anti-aircraft guns, uh, which actually are now just coming out to be available to the public. So it's kind of neat that some of the things that we have on the ship are actually prototypes or things that are products that have, that have turned into reality because of it. So. And you've got some lighting in here as well. Where all does that run through? Right, right. We did, uh, thanks, to, thanks to Rob from Brick Stuff, he, he set us up with a bunch of lights to, to really make the ship pop. We've had a couple of short circuit issues. So you see some of the wires outside, usually that's tucked in inside of everything. I will actually, next time this is in our shop, I will rewire the whole, the, the whole ship just uh, because it, you know, <laughs> it looks a little schleppy with all the wires showing. But um, typically that's not the way it is, but it's uh, all the running lights. You have the search lights lit up, um, running lights. I want to do more, uh, but like I said, it's just always a matter of uh, uh, having enough time to do it when, when it's the few times it is in the shop because this is a big undertaking just setting this up to work on it in our shop is takes about 45 minutes um <laughs> you know unpacking it from its boxes setting it up i mean we could travel around with it and get it set up with a crew of people but um it, it's it's a lot of work <laughs> yeah, i imagine it's a very large build now one piece that you see a ton of on here are tiles and i think with uh, in this current iteration you've tiled like the entire deck now yeah there's not a spot on here and there's a few places here and there where you'll see stud showing and that's because it's not finished so like the backs of the turrets you'll still see the stud showings but that's not really you know people don't really notice mm -hmm. it because it's, it just blends in so well but. So was it difficult to source that many gray tiles for a build of this size? I mean, I know Brickmania is a big company. You've got a lot of builds you're doing, but still, that's a lot of pieces. Yeah, there's a, probably 150,000 tiles on the ship, or maybe more, maybe like 200,000 tiles, just tiles. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of going to, to pick a brick. It's a lot of uh, 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 brick link orders, and and uh, yeah, it's it's just it, it hasn't. It's not something that just happened overnight. There was <laughs> there was a, a year and a half of planning that went into this before I even started putting the bricks together. So, and believe it or not, we're actually getting ready to do our next big mega build too. So, wow. <laughs> so you heard it here first. <laughs> there you go. Brick Mini will have another massive ship touring around. <laughs> it will be. It'll be as exact, just as big as this one. So. Okay. We'll look forward to that. So then you've got, down here is an example of one of the, the kind of bigger turrets on yeah. the ship. So talk about kind of the design of this and how that fits in. Well, the, the, obviously the turrets on one of these ships are just massive. This is like the size of a house. Um, and it's built, I'll pull the top off. You can see how it's built inside. Um, I never, I had, I had high, high hopes that I would actually one day be able to motorize all these guns, and um, I probably still can if I, if I come up with the time. But you can see that it's hollow in there, and these guns would actually be able to depress into the turrets just like a real ship. Um, someday I'll get around to doing it, mm -hmm. um, and it is built to travel. So we, we take these turrets off, and it just comes off. There's gravity holding it on, just like the real ship. Um, let's see if I can get it back on in one piece. That's always a trick. Yeah. <laughs> 
It takes a special skill to get the yeah, turret back yeah, on. Yeah. But then the guns just pop right off, so this, it's, it's designed to travel. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, you obviously had travel in mind when you were designing this. Yeah, well, the, every section, I learned the hard way that you cannot build anything wider than a door. So I've actually had, to, I had these giant castles that I used to build, and, and one day I moved, and I was like, oh, how do I get it out of the house? So now, um, having learned that's not a good idea to build wider than 30 inches, it's built in sections, it's 30 inch slices, and go through any size, standard size door. Okay, yeah. So that makes a lot of sense then. So do you have any idea how many different shows this has been to over the last several years as you've toured around? You know, it's, it's really hard to judge. <laughs> it's, it's at least 100 different, different wow. locations, yeah. Um, there was a year, I mean, this year, this has only traveled to like maybe five events this year. Uh, in previous years, it's been like 30, you know, the year before 30. So maybe not, maybe not 100, maybe like, but still definitely over 50 mm -hmm. um, for sure. Yeah. So has it traveled outside the U.S. or is taking it kind of overseas or anything ever a possibility in your mind for something this size? It, it, it could go anywhere. It's just a matter of cost, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's been, it's been for the four corners of the U.S. I mean, it's for sure it's been to California. It's been to uh, Florida, New England, Seattle, you know, every, and everywhere in between, you know, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, well, that's massively impressive. So then what is the exact, you've mentioned a couple of times how, you know, setup is a really big deal with this. So when you bring this to show, what exactly is that like? What's kind of the process like for that? Well, we have to, you know, I'll just show you how the sections come apart here. So this is, this, you're looking at one section. It just slides apart. Um, and we can pull the, pull the different sections apart. So you can see 30 inches. Um, it's actually built to, to withstand just you being able to pick it up and okay. kind of manhandle it well, except the, the figures. <laughs> but it's it's definitely built for strength. Um, you could stand on this without any 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 problem whatsoever. Um, so you have all these sections. It's actually resting on its crates. So below this 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 custom drop that we had made for it, um, there's there's ten packing crates, and those crates become you know it's a stand when we're when we're parked, you know on display. But uh, when we're not on display, it packs up inside the base. Mm -hmm. so. And I'm sure a lot of that support for, comes from the inside structure there. So what's that like with the, the kind of you know columns and things that keep this up? It's a it's a Technic. Here I'll, I'll actually pull this turret off again, and you'll be able to see that it's a, it's a it's Technic beams um, throughout. Okay. So up top and bottom, you know it's a grid. Basically, it's like two pancakes. The deck is the top one pancake. The bottom is another pancake with bricks built up in between it. Uh, locked together with Technic beams, so it cannot. You can pick it up from the top, and the bottom will not drop out. Mm -hmm. And the whole ship is made that way. You can pick up the, the bigger pieces um, from the top, and the bottom will not fall off. Mm -hmm. So you've done a number of these large-scale builds like this. Then is that something you would recommend to other people if they're looking to build kind of on this scale? Is that type of structure works For really sure. well? I, I, this is my third big mega ship, kind of behind the Nicholas behind us here, being my second. That one has traveled a lot too, but it doesn't travel nearly as well. So a lot of lessons learned on previous builds to went into building this one. Mm -hmm. And then what are the plans for this? So I know we, we talked about how you've had this at a bunch of shows. Is it still planning to be touring in future years or what's that going to be like? Well, we've kind of decided, you know, me being on the road and even Brickmania's crew on the road, it, it's really hard on us. And it's mm -hmm. hard, hard on the models. It's hard on our, our, our staff because this is not our primary business. We, you know, we love to display our models, but ultimately we need to be back in our, in our, in our, you know, in our toy factory <laughs> building toys for you know, our kits. So. We think what we want to do is, is park this thing permanently, uh, if not, you know, 100% permanent, at least to have a, have a normal home where people can come and see it. Mm -hmm. um, that would be in our warehouse in Minneapolis. We're, we used to have a big, our, our old warehouse, which we still use, is, our, is, is primarily where we construct all of our kits. Um, so now what we want to do is um, get another space because that's completely full. We, are, we have 30 workers back in Minneapolis, and they completely fill our warehouse. So we're going to get another warehouse that we can put this in, be open to the public seven days a week. Mm -hmm. so. That would be fantastic. So people could come by and check it out in all its glory here. And then the next ship. So the, the space that we're looking at has room has room for two of these easily, okay. easily. Um, so it'd be open seven days a week. And you know, people always come by Minneapolis, and they they're kind of like, I, I you know, I want to see your your warehouse, but you're not open to the public. And all we can send them to is our store at the Mall of America, which is tiny, and doesn't have much on display. And and you know, when we have these huge, beautiful models, we'd, we'd like to get the public to see them. Mm -hmm. So, Has there been any talk about taking this to the actual Battleship Missouri for a display ever? <laughs> well, we've been approached by some of the other ships in the class okay. about bringing it to their events. Uh, I think Hawaii might just be a little far, because that's where the real Missouri is. Um, you know, if, if obviously, if somebody's willing to pay for it, we would bring it wherever. Uh, and we, we have brought it to different shows on request. You know, we've, we've done video game conventions. We've done things like that. But... Um, typically speaking, uh, uh, non, you know, most of those things are museums or nonprofits, and they don't have a whole lot of money to, 
to, to throw around for right, displays. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, it's me, you know, we basically, I, Brick Mania is a small company. I don't have a, a lot of money to say, hey, I want to show up and, and put this on display. So. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. Well, I'm glad you were able to bring it out here with a bunch of your other builds. Very nice display area here, and it's nice to get it out in public at least once more before it kind of parks itself a bit in that warehouse. Yeah, well, and, and when I say warehouse, it's kind of the misnomer because our where it'll be more of a museum right. setting like this. That we we really appreciate being invited into a, a museum that has lights and um, you know nice facilities. Whereas you know sometimes at Lego conventions, it's 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 not necessarily in the best uh, viewing viewing location. Yes, exactly. Well, I'm glad you could bring it out. Thanks again for setting the whole thing up here and getting the lights on and everything yeah. and taking us through the ship. Appreciate it, Ian. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for uh, speaking with me again. Appreciate it. There you go. That's how you build. <laughs> <laughs> it's all Lego. It's nothing but Lego. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matthew Green with uh, DFW Lug from Fort Worth, Texas. The bill we're talking about today is Pearl Harbor, 1941, and we want to tell the story so the kids can get a sense of history. We start with the launch of the Japanese planes from the Aircraft Carrier Strike Force. They approach through the Kalahali Pass. They then attack Pearl Harbor and Fort Island. There's a defense uh, mock showing the hero heroism of the um, sailors as they try to defend the harbor. And then, of course, the memorial at the end to wrap up the sacrifice that they made. Mm -hmm. That's really great. So if you want to start us kind of at the beginning of the story here, what, what do we have here that, that takes us on to the attack then? Right. So the first um, part of the mock is the strike fleet. It's six aircraft carriers, two battleships, two heavy cruisers. There were 10 fleet oilers and 10 destroyers. And most of them are depicted here. Uh, they snuck in on a rainstorm, behind a rainstorm, and launched their attack. Behind the strike fleet itself is one of the aircraft carriers and um, could not build six of those to fit on the table. So I decided to go with the micro micro scale instead of just the micro scale. Hi, there you go. And it, so you've got the more detailed one in the back here. You want to point out some of your favorite details there and kind of how that was designed? Yeah, the thing that fascinated me about this ship was it was a converted uh, cruiser, heavy cruiser. If you'll notice the lines across the bow and how they, you can see the lines that they come across. That basically, that is the line of the ship originally. Then they just dropped a box on top of it with a double hanger and a flight deck. It was um, obviously cheaper to build, but poorly designed. The anti-aircraft guns on one side couldn't support an attack on the other side. And the whole thing had a wood deck to it, so if a bomb punched through, it set up blaze all of the fuel aviation stores on the, flight deck, on the um, storage decks. So... No reason, uh, no surprise that the ships went down at Midway when our dive bombers were able to, to catch them unaware. Right, exactly. So kind of a, a little bit of a design flaw there then. So, so what do you find is kind of the, the harder parts of building at this really tiny scale here versus maybe a little bit larger scale like most builds you see? Well, you, you have to find a design feature of the piece and build off of it, whether it's the color of the flight deck, whether it's the fueling of the fleet oilers, you know, um, what, whatever you want to make be the important thing. With the heavy cruisers of the Japanese, they had all of their turreted guns on the front of the ship, the bow of the ship. So you'll notice on a cruiser, you've got a line of four turreted guns on the front. Well, for them to shoot directly behind them, they had to shoot through their castle. So trying to find some aspect of it that you can say, this is what's going to make this be this ship. Yeah, kind of the, the iconic part of whatever exactly. the ship is. Exactly. Okay. And then moving on around the corner here, so we've got kind of the, the next part of the story. What is this? This is the Kalahali Pass. Uh, this is where the Japanese fighters, or a group of the Japanese fighters, attacked Pearl Harbor. And uh, iconically made famous by the movie uh, Tora Tora Tora, this is where the Japanese pilot announced to back to the fleet that they had achieved surprise. They made the statements, Tora Tora Tora, which meant we caught them by surprise. Yeah, and so the, you, again, you've got kind of the micro work here and then some cool landscaping work. I, I like you, the way you build up the rocks. Now, did you incorporate some of the, the bigger rock pieces from Lego in there? I did, I did. There's burps and lurps in there. <laughs> so, you know, th those do have uses. If you just need like a large area, you know, and don't want to go super piece heavy, then they're, they are useful for that. As long as you um, hide them somewhat with additional pieces so that they're not totally uniform. Yes, yeah. 
Exactly. So then we move on down to what I think is the, the biggest section of the whole layout here. Yeah, this is Fort Island and the uh, harbor itself. You've got Pearl City on the top left corner. You've got Fort Island, of course, with the landing field on it. You've got Hospital Point, which is where the Nevada ended up when he tried to make its run for the sea. You've got the, the naval base. There's a small housing subdivision that was between the naval base and the submarine base. Then you've got the submarine base and the storage oil tankers. Um, surprisingly enough, the sub base and the oil tankers were not even hit in the attack, which is a little surprising. If you knocked out the fuel, the ships couldn't go anywhere. So a little surprising. That's interesting. Yeah, and then you've got kind of the whole, is this the, the big ship, kind of battleship row type of stuff there? Yeah, battleship row, and then you've got the other ships, and the ships are where they were on that morning, taken from photographs of that day. So the hospital ship uh, is, Mercy is where it was. The um, destroyers and destroyer escorts are where they were tied up at. Um, Everything is as realistic as I can make it based on based on research. Right, and uh, when you're looking into this stuff, do you find that there's there's pretty good photos and things like that to to base your your builds off of? A lot of photos and also a lot of drawings. A lot of drawings. Yeah, there's a lot of, of sketches of where each ship was located at, and then there may have been photos from two days before or three days after that can help me with design. Very nice. And then moving on down here again, we've got kind of a, is this a section of one of the ships yeah, here? This will be a section of one of the ships, and it's not of a particular ship. They probably wouldn't put their anti-aircraft guns that close together. But the idea was just to show the heroism of the men trying to fight. The sea was actually on fire. You had sailors in the water with um, fire all around them. And at the same time, sailors on the ships were trying to shoot down the planes before they could strafe their buddies in the water. Okay. And was that from like oil in the water? Is that is that how? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was from ruptured uh, fuel tanks on the ships or ships that had capsized. Tennessee actually rolled over, so or the Oklahoma. The Oklahoma actually rolled over, and when it rolled over, of course, oil that was in it leaked out, just like an oil tanker would. The uh, Valdez, Exxon Valdez, did. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of nice. You get the the closer up view of the the ship there then as well. And then finally, I think we have the memorial down here. Finally, we have the memorial, the Arizona memorial. And if you look closely, you can see the Arizona itself under the water. So tried to do a, the translucent pieces so that folks could know that there was actually a ship under there. The two forward turrets are visible, one above the water, one just below the water. Because, yeah, if you kind of look at it from the air, you can see the actual ship still underneath Absolutely. there, right? On a, on a clear day when there's not too much traffic <laughs> in the harbor. There you go. Well, this is, this is a great series of builds. What do you find is the reaction when you do historical builds like this, particularly mili military-related builds? What is the general reaction from public and people who look at these when you display it? A lot of people will look to their parents or grandparents that have served in the military, and it's a chance for them to honor them. I actually have some kids that will educate their parents on this is what happened because they had studied this in school recently, and there'll be times when a, a young man or, or lady will spend 20 minutes here going through the whole story with their parent, pointing out everything and you know, showing what they learned in school. Yeah, that's really great, and you're able to kind of incorporate the, the families then like that, get people involved in the builds when they, when they can see those stories. Yeah, I was at a show in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I had a gentleman come up in a wheelchair, and he had actually served in Pearl Harbor, and he pointed to the ship that he actually served on. <laughs> and you talk about a chilling moment. That was, uh, that was just way cool to have met somebody who was actually there on that day. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that. So are there, are there any more plans to expand the story even more at this point? Or I'd like to do a, a mock of the radar installation, which should have given us early warning, but we didn't pay attention because it was early technology, and the guy that answered the phone with the report was not an early adopter. <laughs> and then I'd like to do something that would show the nurses' efforts. I mean, the nurses literally came off the street in their street clothes and started helping people, and I would like to show something that um, pays homage to their their efforts. Yeah, well, I think you did a great job telling, telling the story here so far. Really impressive. So I appreciate you taking us through that. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the time to talk about it. I'm Caden Burton. Uh, I've been here for the past couple of years with uh, the Peleliu displays, um, the, uh, the starter of the worldwide phenomenon in cooking with Caden. Uh, so this uh, September 15th, 1944, uh, codenamed Operation Stalemate II, was the first, fifth, and seventh Marines under the command of General Rupertus um, to take the island of Peleliu and capture the airfield there. Um, the airfield was specifically interesting um, both strategically and tactically. 
strategically, it was one of the only Japanese-built airfields in the Pacific that would house our bombers. Um, it was also needed to be taken because the um, MacArthur's fleet in the South Pacific moving between New Guinea and the Philippines was had the threat of air attack from the right flank, um, since it was a lot easier to refuel Japanese planes and fly shorter distances. So the operation was supposed to take four days. The uh, the fifth fifth Marines um, were the kind of the the starters. They all the, the fifth Marines were able to capture most of the airfield by the end of D-Day, and uh, they it took ended up taking over two months to capture the entire island. Um, Colonel Nakagawa had a very he was a very intelligent um, commander of the Japanese 14th Infantry Division, and was able to hold the island with 11,000 against 30,000. So. Well, that's very impressive. It's great to hear the history there. So take us through the minifigs on each side and kind of how these are laid out and what the design is there. So the, the Japanese, this is basically depicting the 5th Marine, 2nd Battalion K Company uh, assaulting the right flank of the airfield. So this would be kind of a radio building and maybe a you know, Japanese headquarters building. Um, and then the, the Japanese uh, small regiment of infantry against the, uh, the, the K Company here. And then what kind of pieces do you have in the minifigs? Is that custom stuff? How'd that work? The minifigs, they're all um, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit torsos, and then custom painted legs, uh, which I did here in the past few days, as well as a lot of the, all the marine helmets with the camouflage patterns are also painted. Um, but the, the, the light tanks, the Japanese were assisted by a unit of light tanks, uh, and the, the marines had their armor, of the, the M4 Shermans, the M3 Stewarts. So you did that custom painting. Talk a little bit more about what that's like for you as you're as your custom painting stuff and, and what that looks like on the helmets. Well, so a lot of the a lot of this was last minute stuff. Um, when we got to the show, a lot of these helmets were black and all the all the um, legs were just their basic colors. And I had some friends tell me I should do it. So uh, I ended up painting all of the black helmets tan first, letting that dry, and then painting on the camouflage patterns. It took about 45 minutes each. Uh, and I did about, I think, 40, 43 of them in the past few days, so some, some late nights, but uh, got them all done. Yeah. So how, how many sections is this built in when you set this up at a show? Uh, it splits into eight 48 by 48 base plates. They're all connected by um, Technic pins and then uh, long ways, and then across they're all connected by certain things. So in the forest there's a singular plate that connects those to uh, the main hill with the under machine gun fire on the second two that connects that and then the buildings all here are connected by some little mounds of sand that are that were added after the fact. Mm -hmm. So as you're working on a build like this do you look at photos from uh, the battlefield where it took place or what kind of is the inspiration and source material? So this this one in particular uh, was built basic, uh, based off of a lot of pop culture um, being that there's not a whole lot some, some of the Pacific um, HBO show that came on okay. That's where a lot of this is from since I didn't want to do the airfield quite yet. I wanted to do something between the jungle and the airfield. Um, so all the battle maps down here kind of really help with that. And the, uh, uh, there's a Japanese archive on the far right that has the whole schematic of the island that I use as well. Um, but So this one's a lot of pop culture, but next year the, um, the airfield doing a collaboration will be twice the size. It'll be, that'll be all based off of the schematics of the island. Nice. Well, we'll look forward to that then. Thanks for taking us through the build here. It's really great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm joined by Dan Siskin. He's going to take us through over 100 World War II LEGO military vehicles that sure. Brickmania has sold as kits, as well as just other ones they made for different projects over the years. So fantastic lineup here. Sure, thanks. Well, we'll start left to right. I mean, this is, this is actually, I should say that this is a collection of stuff. It's most of what you see here it has been a former kit of Brickmania. Um, some of them were made for instruction books. I will just, I'll give you a little idea. Uh, as we go down. So we'll actually start with the first one here because this actually isn't a Brick Mania kit. This was a, a model by my friend Rum Runner. He's uh, from up in ca uh, Canada and he's worked with Brick Mania kind of on and off as, as he's, he's, a, he's a critic of our models and, <laughs> and, and he builds them. So this is kind of a copy of one of our, my original little Stuart tanks and he made a British version of it. So it's a desert version. So some you know, minor updates and modifications mm -hmm. he made to it. And I thought I'd bring it here because it's, it's a really cool model and we'll probably never make a kit of it, but it's definitely worth the display. Right next to it's a Matilda tank. So these are all British that you're looking at. Uh, was a kit. It's a it's a it's a, a World War II infantry tank. Um, was a kit. Next to that is the Grant, which uh, was one of my earlier uh, World War II kits. So this was it wasn't even a kit really. This was something I made just for 
um, some instructions years and years ago. I, I, when I got back into doing Brick Mania back in 2007, 2008, this was going to be an instruction book. And in fact, I did release an instruction book of it. Um, so that's really old model. Same with the, uh, the priest right next to it. Never Brick Mania kits, but... You, <laughs> Just kind of things you put together to have instructions for. Yeah, and we used, when Brick Mania first kind of relaunched um, after the 2003 to 2008 break, um, these were the ways I got back into it, making these, these, these models. Mm -hmm. so. do, you, do you notice a big difference in kind of your build style from back then and how, how you did those compared to what, if you're working on a kit it's today? Definitely like chunkier, lots more stud showing. Um, that's all I had to work with, you right, know what yeah. I mean? I did, the, the Lego has changed a lot, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, part selection, part colors, just, you know, the, new, the newer pieces mean that you, you have a lot more versatility. There's no cheese slopes on any of those. It just, they, they, the parts didn't exist yet, <laughs> so. So as you move down, um, this one here is a Crusader tank, so that's kind of a more recent Brick Mania kit. The one next to it is, is one of Yitzi's Valentine tanks. Uh, we never made it as a kit. Um, we, did, we do this micro brick battle uh, game, and we wanted a full minifig size representation of the Valentine, which is for the micro brick battle game. Um, so we had a card that came with it. We just built it for a picture, basically. Mm -hmm. So maybe someday when we do Rats and Foxes Part 2, that'll, that'll appear in that instruction book, along with the Crusader. Um, next to it is a, this is a Sherman Firefly. This is one of, uh, one of the models, first models, uh, American tank models that our new desire, designer Cody built. So Cody O'Sell designed the, the Firefly. We happen to like the, the, uh, the, 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 the fond humor in putting the, uh, the, the little pow flag on it. So that was a, a, a nice addition. Next to that is a, it's a, it's a Canadian actually pattern artillery tractor. Um, so Cody and I worked on this together. He made the tractor, I made the limber and the gun. So it's a British 25 pounder gun. Next to that, this is another one, never releases a kit. It's a, it's a British uh, mobile artillery gun called the Sexton. Um, another one that we just needed a picture of it, so we, had, we built one. It's a lot of things. We need a picture. We need something for a historical do document. We need to build it. So we is, don't it, is that something you ever try to do like digitally, or is that pretty, you pretty much all build it physically generally if you want something like that? Well, the, when we build instructions, make our, make our, uh, the way we do our designing, it's, it's strictly um, bricks first. Okay. We always build in bricks first. There are tools out there, obviously, for, for you know, designing or, or making like Lego instruction, you know, uh, instruction books and stuff. We find those are way clumsier. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a certain amount of respect for people who do digital designing, but usually you can tell when people have done it digitally and then you build it like it doesn't hold together, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So we like to be able to build with our hands first. So that's, that's, a, that's an example of it. So the next down the line are just three, three more sort of a World War II desert British, British, and this, this one actually happens to be Australian. Uh, it's an Australian copy of a British vehicle. It, it gets it, confusing. <laughs> right. It's, they call it the local pattern. So, okay. uh, you know, the, in World War II, the Britain called in all of its uh, Commonwealth countries to contribute to the war effort, and they brought with them their own equipment, and this is, just happens to be the, the Australian version of the, the British Universal Carrier. Next to that, you have three French tanks. These are early World War II French tanks. The one on the left, the little Renault here, and the Samoa on the right were both kits that we released, uh, and they're uh, long sold out now. Uh, the one in the middle was never released. It's a FCM 36 uh, French light tank. We are in the process right now of putting together a Blitzkrieg bricks instruction book. So we, we wanted to get all the, the notable French tanks in that book. So we built that middle tank just for the instruction book. The, so. the camo pattern on that is fantastic. Do you find that's one of the harder details to achieve with some of these uh, vehicle designs, it's kind of that camouflage or melding the different colors? We, we like doing it. It's another challenge. And it's not everybody can get it right. So mm -hmm. you, when you're looking at pictures, you go, how is this camouflage done and how can I do it in bricks? And, mm -hmm. um, sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. Um, the, you know, the Samoa here has, is camouflage, and you'll notice it's more of a horizontal pattern. That's actually intentional. Um, you know, at different eras, different times, there are actual patterns of how they would do it. And, there was a, there was a, the French were really known for like thinking, oh, let's do it as a horizontal print because that's, you know, land or water, land, sky, and that's the way that the earth looks. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have the sort of like more splotchy camouflage, like a, like a jungle camouflage almost. So on to, after that is a whole series of Russian tanks. So some of these were made for our books. Um, this T-26 is an old Operation Barbarossa. We, we had a series of kits. Um, Next to it is a, uh, what is this, a BT-5, it's a fast tank. 
we never actually made a, a kit of this. We did a BT-7, we did the next one in the series, and we had a need to go back and make the BT-5 because we were making a certain scenario, we needed it for picture. So we, we, again, picture only, never releases a kit. And then next to that, T-34, T-34-85, Russian tank was a kit. Uh, it's probably one of the most requested things for us to bring back right now because um, we've done a, a different T-34, the, the earlier war versions. Everybody wants this one, so we'll bring it back eventually. Um, next to that, you have the KV series. Here, let's take a, take a look at these together side by side. So this is the KV-1, and right next to it is the KV-2. Look at the size of the turret on that thing. That's like a battleship turret, you know? <laughs> So same hull, but they decided they wanted an artillery piece in there. So we built them both. In fact, we made a kit that you, this is, no, it was actually, this is the kit, and you had instructions to build that turret on it. So okay. <laughs> we have fun with this stuff. That's certainly a very unique turret when you're looking at the vehicles yeah. here. You can't hide that very well. It's definitely a, definitely a, a you know, there's issues, mm -hmm. obvious issues. So let me see if I can get these put back, sort of in some semblance of, of order. I dropped one. I'll figure it out later. Oh, so IS-2, this is Joseph Stalin. Iosef Stalin, this is the, you know, the Russian tank. Um, heavy tank, notably, you'll see pictures of this in Berlin after World War II. There's all these victory parades, and they, they march these tanks, maybe because it's Joseph Stalin's namesake. Um, but that's, that's another one. So I knocked the antenna off. I'll have to fix it later. So self-propelled artillery pieces. We have two, the KV-85. Um, that's not a KVA. What is it? SU-85. Self-propelled gun, 85-millimeter gun barrel. Over to the right of it is the 155, SU-152. It's like basically a six-inch howitzer stuck in a tank hull. Um, and then next to that is an even bigger gun called Stalin Sledgehammer. So they would wheel these things up into towns and just, like, destroy entire city blocks with one, one, one shell in it. Um, wow. Yeah, it needs a little TLC. It didn't travel all that well. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of some of these kits have been in bags for like a year or two, mm -hmm. and we take them out like, oh, that's not survived the moving around. Um, this is a Katusha rocket launcher. So this is a this is actually a Studebaker truck. So during World War II, the United States lit, sent over tr uh, shiploads of American equipment to the Russians, and the Russians, you know, uh, were busy fighting the Germans. And they converted these into, this is called a Katusha, it's a rocket truck, basically. Um, so a big, giant rocket volley, They'll just all these things will basically shoot off one right after the other. And if you're unlucky enough to be on the receiving end of that, you're going you're gonna to be in for a lot of pain. Now, is this something, so you've got all these rockets here, uh, it kind of brings up the idea of playability. Is that something Brick Mania tries to incorporate well, very much? You will or? notice that they are flick missiles, so you can, you can flick them off if you want. We, we don't do that on every model, but every, every once in a while we do kind of like the, the nod and the wink to the LEGO designers. And, okay. and we'll, we'll, we'll incorporate some of their innovations. So, yeah, you can shoot these rockets off. You can flick them off. But, um, I probably wouldn't do it very well. I'm not, I'm not very well practiced in the flick missile technology and techniques, I should say. Mm -hmm. So here again, more. We have some artillery pieces in, in here. These three right here, well, let's say these three here are kits, or have been kits. These three were only made for props. So you have this little, it's a little armored car. Um, I think it's a BA-6 armored car. Only made in kits. It's fully functional. Make a great little, only available instructions. would make a great little little kit. But uh, someday we'll release maybe either instructions or, or kit or both. Mm -hmm. Uh, this as well. So three pieces that are only available. I guess they're not even available anyway. Anyway, we just use them for picture props. Um, next to them are two Polish vehicles. This is a Polish uh, what's it? KTS. I don't TKS. I believe. I don't have the, I don't have the right, benefit yeah, of having the card. Yeah. The card, so it's so, hard to remember all TKS the armored car. John Canepa actually made this. So John, who used to do Brick Brigade, has joined Brick Mania, and he's helping me finish up that Blitzkrieg Bricks instruction book. So all the all the major combatants, Poland, France. We're going to even have not Holland and Belgium represented in this book. Some of the less remembered countries. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're not less remembered, but we don't remember their contributions, right. their, their, their equipment. So this is a Polish uh, 7TP tank. It's, a, it's like a seven-ton light tank copied from the British light tank. But not, not many people knew that the Polish actually had really good tanks at the beginning of World War II. They just didn't have very many of them. So uh, Then we started into the Americans. So... This like little area right here in front is this is the ode to Dodge. These are all various Dodge vehicles, mm -hmm. um, starting out with Patton's uh, 
uh, command vehicle. Uh, it's a Dodge, I can't remember the number, WC-56 or 57, something like that. Ambulances, two different ambulances, weapons carriers, and then the one GMC vehicle right here is the, the CCKW. So this is a deuce and a half, the famous truck that you would hear about them driving supplies and convoys to, to, to various points in Europe and, and, and Asia. Um, this is kind of out of order. Let's, let's reverse this here. Well, let's put the armored car first. So this is a M1 armored car, scout car. Next to that, you have these half tracks, two half tracks. You have the M3 and then the M16, which is actually called the, affectionately called the Kraut mower. It's, it's four 50 caliber machine guns. And they made these for anti-aircraft use. But by the time the United States had actually entered the war in Europe, there really wasn't that much use for anti-aircraft guns. So they would lower these against ground targets, infantry, anything that was caught in the open and that you could easily take out just about anything with yeah. four 50 right. caliber machine guns. A couple of uh, amphibious vehicles here. Um, these are, they would be in the Pacific for sure, but they also were in D-Day, that kind of thing. So LVT, this is a basically amphibious landing tractor. So troops would be in here that could drive, it could swim through the water, drive up onto the beach, ramp goes down, guys come running out and they'd, they'd do whatever they need to do. Um, this is a fire support version, same sort of concept, but it actually has a, 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 an artillery piece mounted on the roof. So these would land together. Um, Soften up the, 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 the troops on the shore, and then these guys would come and capture. Mm -hmm. That was the theory, anyway. It didn't always work out so right. well. Then we start getting into the American tanks here. So you have a, the little M2A4 Stuart. This is only really used by the Marines on Guadalcanal. And they were quickly given the M3 Stuart, which is the next one. I don't have it here, but we have an M5 Stuart. They kept coming out with this, the calling. There's all the Stuart light tank series, but it went from M2 to M3 to M5. Um, I think they skipped M4 because the Sherman was the M4. Um, anyway, speaking of Sherman, was, I actually, I won't change them around. <laughs> M M18 Hellcat tank destroyer, one of the most popular models we've ever done. Um, just unfortunately, we can't get pieces to keep making these as kits. Is Someday that, we'll make Is that the biggest limitation on kind of re-releasing or releasing these things as kits, is just the, getting those pieces to be able to put out enough? It's kits. It's a, it's a combination of parts um, and demand. If there's not enough demand, we're just going to be, okay, that was cool. Right. Um, well, if there's a super huge amount of demand, and, and we do read our comments on, on YouTube, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and, and we could judge, you, could, you can definitely tell if something's going to be popular because you get a lot of requests for it. And also sending, we get emails. So, I mean, we, we, we pay attention to all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely the Hellcat was one of the most requested vehicles we have. Um, we'll probably re-release it at some point in the future. Um, next to that, we start getting into the Sherman territory. This is a, this is a U.S. Marine Corps Sherman. Um, U.S. Marine Corps had different Shermans. They're diesel-powered Shermans. Um, most all American equipment is gasoline-powered, but the Marines sort of get the cast off every time from what the Army doesn't want anymore. The Army was using the diesel, the diesel-powered Shermans to, for training, but they didn't want to send them anywhere because they'd have to have a second fuel supply. You know, mm -hmm. it's easy to just say, okay, we're only going to have gasoline. We don't have to supply gasoline, so that's what they did. Marines got them. They used them until the end of the war. Next to that is a M10 Wolverine tank destroyer. Basically, a tank destroyer is a fast, lightly armored tank that has a huge gun to shoot other tanks with. So it's a Sherman hull, but it's, it's, it's not quite as well armored as a Sherman tank would be. Sherman tank would have three inches of armor in the front. That only has a one and a half inches. That's the difference. <laughs> uh, so we start getting back into Sherman territory. This is a Sherman jumbo it's an assault tank. It's a Sherman with just extra armor, extra wide tracks. Um, they used them in Europe against like fortified positions. They weren't uh, then weren't really designed to fight other other tanks. Mm -hmm. um, then you have the Easy Eight Sherman um, next to that. This is if you're familiar with the movie Fury, this would be the tank that was in it. At the end of the war, the U.S. Army came out with the Chaffee, which is a light another light tank to replace the the little Stuart class. Um, it looks more like it looks it looks more like a uh, modern tank than the old Stuarts did. So. <laughs> More, more Sherman derivatives. Uh, this is a uh, M7 Priest. It's an artillery piece basically on a, on a Sherman hull and the M31 Armored Recovery Vehicle. Um, it's actually an M3 Grant hull, but well, <laughs> it's, it's another Sherman in the Sherman family for sure. But it's, 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 it's basically when you, when you get your, shank, your, your tank shot up in the, in the field, these guys will go out and recover them, okay. patch up the holes and send them back out with a new crew in it. So into the American artillery section here. We've basically done every American artillery piece in World War II. 
we don't have them all here, but we have one anti-tank gun, um, three or four different howitzers. There's an even there's two bigger ones that we don't have yet, so future releases. Mm -hmm. And I brought a couple of these uh, navy navy vehicles, so navy jeep, two bulldozers. Um, the the Americans are responsible for building tons and tons of, of bases, cities, everything you name it in the Pacific during World War II. So it, Really common, you see CBs, which are the Navy construction battalions, everywhere in the Pacific in World War II. Uh, they were really all over Europe as well. So, building ports, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to the Japanese stuff. So we're, we're like, this is like, we're basically covering everything, sort of chronologically, and then by by country too. So, Japanese pillbox. This was a set. It was like a play set. You get the Japanese anti anti aircraft gun, and then Japanese pillbox. Um, it ended up being fairly expensive. But people keep asking us, "Hey, we want bunkers. We want all kinds of." They're like, well, "All right, we'll make them," but you know, as we as we predicted, it'll be expensive and and, and not as popular because of the, the high prices. So, it's just funny. You get to hear the inside of what's going on. Why why Brickmania does what it does. So now we're in the Japanese tanks, and a lot of people don't know that there were a lot of Japanese tanks, but because um, they're they're more known for like their uh, ships, you know, the navy navy battles and the you know bombing of Pearl Harbor and that kind of thing. We have two little tankettes. Tankettes weren't actually like, they're not like just miniature tanks. They're basically what the, the purpose of these tankettes was to either bring supplies to frontline troops and have some sort of armored protection for the guys driving them, or else they would tow um, artillery pieces. Okay. Um, so two tankettes, Japanese light tank, the earlier medium tank, this is Type 89, I think, and then Type 97, uh, later, later in the war, medium tank. So. Almost the entire Japanese tank family tree here. They made more uh, that came at the end of the war, but I just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. So now in our little foray into Italian vehicles, just kind of new to Brickmania. So this this little guy here is actually a British truck, but the the the, the British and the Italians you know stole each other's and captured each other's vehicles so much it's kind of a, a blurry line between <laughs> who who really owns them. So mm -hmm. this is actually a British a British. Uh, a British truck with Italian flags painted on it, and they had a, 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 a Italian anti-aircraft gun. Really common, so that's a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun on a captured British truck, which is actually uh, actually a Canadian pattern truck. Too. <laughs> to further complicate things, uh, this is a, a this is kind of cool. This is this is a a Italian artillery tractor, but if you if you notice, the wheels will turn. It has front front and rear wheel steering. And you turn the spare tire to make the wheels go. So, I, I had fun. I made this one. I had fun playing with it. So this, this we, we do all kinds of geeky things. If you notice the wheels turn on here. Oops, dropped the spare tire. But the gun makes the wheels turn. So we do all kinds of geeky stuff like that. We, mm -hmm. you know, because we can. <laughs> so Italian tank, an Italian. Uh, it's like an assault gun. Basically the same hulls. Cody made the tank. Yitzi made the tank. The the little assault gun. And then we have the big Italian tank. It's actually in German markings because by the time the Italians got around to building this thing, the Germans were running the, running the show there. So you can see that I never did finish it. This was just a prop. <laughs> Oops, and I broke it. It was a prop for a picture. All I needed was for the picture. Maybe someday we'll, we'll release it as a kit. But, um, I don't know. <laughs> Brick mania runs in mysterious ways. What comes? What, what you never we never know what's going to come out. Right, right. It's, we don't even know what's coming out sometimes. And now we have this whole entire German. Which is there's a lot of German vehicles here, and, and we probably have as many German vehicles in our warehouses there are in this entire table. Uh, I just didn't think it would be very representational to concentrate on that much stuff. Yeah. The, the Germans went crazy. They take one vehicle and then they'd make a hundred variations of it. Um, and we pretty much made them all. So just just for instructions or for just you know for pictures and stuff. Mm -hmm. So Kubel wagon, which is the of course the Volkswagen Rabbit. They're not Volkswagen Rabbit. The Volkswagen Beetle. So this is this is the military version of the Beetle. It's, Kubel means bucket, so it's the bucket car because it had four bucket seats. Oh, okay. And it is exactly the same chassis and engine that's in the the, the Beetle that was built until like the 1970s. So. Um, some some this is a German transport truck in the early in the war they didn't have a whole lot they just they used whatever they could get so they they didn't have much material and they just took commercial vehicles and, and basically turned them into military vehicles eventually they came up with these half tracks so this is two different half tracks one's pull this one's designed to pull a, a, an artillery piece this one's just for guys we got time yeah. <laughs> okay good um, and we start getting into tanks. Um, 
a lot of these tanks are, I mean, most of what you see here are just older kits uh, at this point. Um, this is a uh, Panzer II T-38, which is when the, when the, when the Germans invaded and, and, and an ex-Czechoslovakia, they basically took over their armaments plants. So this is a Czech tank made for the Germans. Um, then you get into the Panzer III, Panzer IV. These are two early Panzer IVs. Tell they're early because of the short guns. They were basically small artillery pieces um, inside the gun. Later on, they decided, well, let's, we need a bigger gun because the Russians, Russians had better tanks than we mm -hmm. did, so we need bigger guns to fight them. These are Sturmgeschutz, they're assault, assault tanks. Uh, they don't have the traditional turrets. They're made to be low as possible to the ground so you can sneak up on enemy fortifications without being seen um, or hide in the bushes and wait for their tanks to approach and shoot them. Um, this is the famous Opel Blitz truck, just in a desert, desert camouflage, basically. Uh, with an anti-aircraft anti gun stuck in the back. Another one we only put in a book. We never actually actually sold that one. Same with the Schwimmwagen. These two here, the Schwimmwagen and the Puma, only appeared in the Battle of the Bulge book that we put out. Um, yeah, there's no kit ever been made. <laughs> Someday, maybe. <laughs> no, yeah, maybe. Like that, that camouflage. These are all what's called ambush camouflage. You can see that the next six vehicles or so all have this camouflage. The Germans discovered camouflage late in the war and decided the gray wasn't good enough anymore. It's all going to be this this kind of modeled camouflage um it takes a you know there's an extra layer when you're designing sets of like this it's just extra complication because you want mm -hmm. the camouflage to look good mm -hmm. and we did a whole series of of this sort of camouflage vehicles we were doing covering doing our battle of the bulge book and it's been popular we'll have to do another book because some of these vehicles had came out after the book was published so this is a puma half track this is a Panzer IV L70, which means this gun is 70 times the length of its width. So it's it's an anti it's a really basically really powerful, um, really really powerful anti tank gun. Same gun as in this Panther tank. Then you go to here's the King Tiger, which is like the the mother of all German tanks in World War II, um, as far as this being big and powerful, intimidating and effective. And then of course, here's the the regular Tiger, which is also very very famous. I should fix this gun while I'm standing here. It's an anti-aircraft gun on there. Of course, uh, I will let you in on a secret that Brick Arms. This is this little ammo belt that's sticking out of this machine gun here. Um, it is one of the more rare pieces Brick Arms has ever done. They have to hand make them when we ask for them. Um, we just found out prototypes. Saw them on the internet that he's going to make a pack with those bullets. Wow. Finally, so depending on when this video comes out, you might be the first to know that there will actually be a a ammo pack um, that you will be able to get that ammo belt finally after he's teasing the world like for five six years with that that piece and finally we'll be able to get them mm -hmm. so all right enough to hear uh, some more various oddball anti-aircraft guns from the germans you have this rso which is a um i don't know call it it's a rope and rope and schlepper it basically it's it's just it's it's a it's it's a it's a utility truck on on, on tracks mm -hmm. uh, that they can drive in the snow but in this case it's got an anti-aircraft gun stuck in it um, various other anti-aircraft guns. So <clears throat> this is the famous German 88, uh, feared by flyers and uh, tank drivers combined. When Germany first invaded France, they didn't realize that the French had better tanks, and they had the Germans had nothing that they could they could they could fight the, the French tanks until Rommel had the bright idea of using the anti-aircraft gun against the tanks, and this thing just it just sliced right through them. So famous, it's the feared and famous uh, Flak 88. And this whole apparatus here is just, that's how they moved it. Mm -hmm. Like all the, all the men that would be involved with yeah, transporting that. this gigantic truck to transport it. And then they'd pick these that actually connect to the, to the, um, uh, the sort of cruciform mounting that, that that's on. The, the, the legs would, would fold up and then it would just turn into like a big gigantic long vehicle. So there's a guy who had to actually ride in the back of this vehicle. That would, he, had a, he had a brake, I think. You know? <laughs> so like in hook and ladder trucks, the, the guy rides in the back. <laughs> same sort of concept. All right, now we're going to transition to aircraft. So, again, this isn't even all the aircraft we've done. This is just most a sampling of World War II aircraft. We brought this is this is when a Cody made a fuel tanker. So it's kind of the oddball. It's a British fuel tanker truck, but in 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 context with all these British airplanes, it actually makes sense. So, the fuel browser Bowser, and then this is a Hawker Hurricane, um, the other British famous British World War II aircraft. You have the, and then you have of course the Spitfire would be the more famous one. So I have three Spitfires here, um, this being a tropical version for fighting in the desert. This would be, this was in Mediterranean camouflage. 
And then the last one back here is the Battle of Britain camouflage. So for different areas, they painted them differently. Mm -hmm. they, they figured out, you know, for whatever reason, the, the countryside was different color. Um, we have a little bit of a, the Soviet Union represented here. This is a Cody's um, Sturmovic, IL-2 Sturmovic. Um, this is kind of neat, the, the undercarriage. Oops, dropped, lost the propeller tip. But you have little bombs. It's it basically a ground attack plane, so it's got lots of cool little little features. The, I love how the landing gear fold up, though. It's just, mm -hmm. like, super slick. You're using, like, the tires there for the bombs as well? Yeah, yeah. So we, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of, like, little secrets, going, you know, things going on in this thing. Build, builder's secrets. See if I can put that back together so it doesn't fall over. These, these are amazingly heavy airplanes, so they have to actually support themselves. Let me get that piece. The curse, the builder's curse, parts yeah. that fall off. <laughs> so typically speaking, we, we try to build everything as sturdy as possible. So this is Japanese Zero. Uh, this is one of my early, older designs. We, we did a, this kit, like, the first Zero I did was like almost 20 years ago now. Um, they're getting a little bit better. So folding landing gear, real simple, simple design. Um, See if I, I'll just, you know, I'll just leave it folded in for now. <laughs> Come back. It doesn't make good photography. To two P51 Mustangs. We've actually made several additional P51 Mustangs, but this is these are the two that I had easily easy to grab. Mm -hmm. um, Cody did a newer, updated design, so that that's available as a kit currently. It's a P51B. These are D models here. So. If anybody's wondering. <laughs> so are the updated designs something you try to do a lot of Brick Mania as far as if, if new pieces come out or whatever, you can make a better design? Is that something you try to do? There's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. Sometimes, like, these are, like, the late war P-51s, and we were representing the end of the war. We were trying to capture 1943, so it's a different Mustang, but okay. while while we're updating the model, we'll actually change a lot of the, you know, defects or, like, hey, new parts have come out, or here's a new idea of how to build this, and, and we will incorporate that. And we're real, real open to... to you know, constantly um, improve our products. And not, every time, by the time we release something, we're already like, oh man, I wish I would have changed this. I wish, so when something comes around again, maybe a year or two later, we can fix all the defects, if we remember. <laughs> uh, so this big thing right next to it, the, the, the Mustang, this is a P38 Lightning. Cody designed this one. It has one of the highest concentrations of printed elements and stickers in, in any kit at size that we've done. Um, I think all these little pieces are printed, custom printed. Wow. Uh, uh, it wants to tip backwards. Um, has a pretty amazing uh, landing gear system too, folding, you know, fold, folding landing gear. Um, pretty much, it's kind of become the hallmark of all the Brickmania airplanes is try to make everything fold if we can. Mm -hmm. It is a very, very tail heavy plane, but it does work. This one here is one of Cody's um, Corsairs, F4 Corsair, F4U Corsair. This is one of the most sought after models that Brick Mini's ever done. We only made 150 of these and we get requests for it almost every day. So, <laughs> instead uh, of the folding wings on there? It does fold. Um, let's see if I can do it without breaking it. Uh, don't remember where the fold is on this one. Cody, I, I don't even know. I don't even want to try okay, on this. Okay, that's one. fine. Yeah, we don't want to break it. <laughs> yeah, Cody's not here to put it back together if I break it. Um, but it, do, it does definitely folds everything that we do. His later one folds better. Cody, where is that? I don't know. I don't even want to try, <laughs> especially since I'm on, uh, we're being recorded right now. And then we have a, after that, we have a triad of, uh, of Messerschmitts. So this is like the, the famous ME or BF-109 Messerschmitt um, from World War II. There, there, there's slight variations in each one of them. These are from different different eras. Again, whenever we want to build something better, we'll, we'll make small improvements. Mm -hmm. These are, are on, on slated to be completely redone. So we're going to put out another Messerschmitt sometime in the next year. Um, we'll scrap this design completely, start over from scratch. So because just so many new pieces have come out. Yeah. This is like a four or five year old, or at least a three, three, four year old model at this point. And we, we could do better. <laughs> these last little things here, these are one seven hundred scale battleships. Um, I did the North Carolina after touring the North Carolina, at you know after some show I think Brick Magic or something, and it's like I could build that. Um, in fact, they they kind of asked me to, and I never got back to them. I, I built it, and we made some sets. Um, it's kind of unique for a Brick Mania model is that there's actually hard to see, but there's like serial number on the back. And Tommy from uh, the Brick Engraver, he made little 
little because uh, he's from North Carolina. So he, he wanted to be in, involved in this. So he made a little North Carolina USS North Carolina yeah. tile. So very limited edition of these. There's only like 50 or 60 made. So this would almost be like the Brickmania version of like the Lego architecture line. You know, you've yeah. got the, the, the fancier stands and everything. De definitely, definitely. Yeah. So then we did a, uh, a USS Missouri um, because we have the big ship. Mm -hmm. So we wanted, we wanted to have something that co coincided with that. So we built the big one. And then, of course, if you're going to have the Missouri, we, you might as well build the, the Yamato, too. So this is the, the pride and joy of the Imperial Japanese Navy, or at least it was until it sank. <laughs> but they still, I mean, think of how important the ship is. They, there's, like, entire cartoon lines are still, like, you know, it's yeah. space Yamato. A lot of cultural influence, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it does have a lot of impact. So we built it. We did, like, a, we did a whole series called the Wonder Waffa, like Wonder Weapons that are going to win the war. And we had to release the Yamato as part of that, so. <laughs> Inside of here, I don't know if you're getting a lot of glare in there, but you can get, get a decent shot of it. This is the B-17. This is this is the monster piece that Cody made um, earlier this year. We're like, what if we built a giant B-17 model bomber? Because we get requests all the time for like, that's too big. We'll never, nobody would ever buy it. So we sort of pulled our, our audience and said, yeah, we'll do it, uh, but we'll do it pre-order only. So we don't, we only make as many as we need. So we put a pre-order up in April, and they sold out in pre-order. We, we put we decided we're gonna do a batch of fifty. Did a batch of fifty that sold out in less than a day. Wow! And so we we, just, we agreed to do another batch of fifty, and it took about two weeks, but those are gone as well. <laughs> um, so right now at this point, I think we're we're in the, we're involved in making a third batch of this. So this is like I don't know how many pieces is in this thing. It's like five or six thousand probably at least at least four thousand pieces. I, I give you that much, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's impressive. So you mentioned doing the pre-order things. That's something that Brickmania has done with past kits, or or something you're trying to. Very, and, very you know, I, Lego is now trying that with their new new line that they just oh, announced really? of doing. Yeah, some some that's like pre-order like crowdfunding type of stuff to kind of get an idea of whether it'll be popular or not. Oh, so right, right, yeah, I heard about. That. Yeah, so I, is that something you found success, successful for you? Well, we've only done it a couple times. Okay. We've done it in the past, and this wasn't necessarily crowdfunded. It was just sort of like, well, we'll do it, but if you, if you want to get in on it from the ground floor, you're going to have to pay up front because mm -hmm. it's just too much. I mean, it's the retail price that was $1,700. So you can imagine how much it would cost us to build that right. many models. We're like, well, it's gonna, it would kill us financially to do it. So let's let's see if uh, uh, if there's interest first and then if we can get people to pay for it. So the people who got it, the pre-order got it for like almost $500 cheaper than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> the advantage of buying early. Yeah, yeah. Because so, we, we gave them and said, look, look, if you pay us, you pay for it now, we're going to give you twenty at least 20% off the, the list price of it. Um, and a lot of that's probably why we sold so many right away off the bat. Mm -hmm. So, so with all of decided it's, it's a really cool model. Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's ex excellent design. With all these kits, then that we've seen, you know, smaller and very large like this, yeah. is it difficult to come up with design still? With so many, you've done so many different iterations of, uh, especially like World War II vehicles and stuff. Do you find it difficult? Or is there just so much content out there that you can continue to create this stuff? There's always content, and in fact, we always have to keep stuff in reserve. We're okay. like, we're like. Um, we have so many ideas. We're like, well, that'll be for some other theme down the future. We have to figure out a context to put it in. So mm -hmm. I don't think we'll ever run out of stuff. And then certain things that are popular, we just people, you know, we're a kit company. We make we make model kits, and there's certain kits like the Sherman tank will never not be popular. <laughs> so what you know, maybe somebody who's gotten into to Brick Mania five years ago bought a Sherman kit, but somebody who might hear about us for the first time tomorrow would probably still be interested as well. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Sherman, Sherman tanks, Jeeps, Corsairs, P51 Mustangs, we'll sell for the more iconic kind of vehicles yeah. and things. So we're, we're kind of like, we'll keep those in stock and we'll always have to change them because, you know, we don't make the parts. We're, we're, we're held hostage by Lego and, and, and everybody else that we partner with. So we, you know, I guess say held hostage is not the, the best, <laughs> but, but we are definitely, yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of at their mercy of what they're releasing and what they're putting right. out there. And they're not thinking of us. <laughs> <laughs> they're not going, Oh, brick mania might need these parts. No, they don't, they don't This they, would make a good, you know, tank barrel here. Yeah. <laughs> we're just a tiny blip on their radar. Um, if we're even on their radar at all. So. Yeah. Well, fascinating. Thanks for taking the time to take us through all of those different yeah. vehicles. I love hearing kind of the history and some of the design over the years there and can't wait to see where it goes in the future. So thank you. Yeah. You're looking at like, 10 years of Brickmania model, or more, if not more than 10 years of, of, of Brickmania's sort of evolution of, of design here. A lot of thought and hard work went into all of these yep. kids. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I don't know about thought, but uh, or even hard work for that That's matter. That's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks for taking us through it. Yeah, you're welcome. My name is Aiden Beckendam, and I am Jacob Beckendam. Okay. And um, we are from this general California Anaheim area, okay. and this is our mock on Point Du Hoc. 
which was a family effort that we worked on for about a year. And we went there, and we've always had a fascination with D-Day, so it was fun to go and build it. So there was a big infrastructure inside made out of multicolored bricks, and um, we called it a BUB, which is an big acronym. Big Ugly Building. <laughs> so that's, that's B-U-B for Big Ugly Building? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then, um, then there's the cliff, and then the general, and then the famous point, which, and then the little rock extending outwards. And then we have three of the bunkers, the observation bunker, and two of the gun bunkers. And we added in the guns for dramatic effect, even though they weren't really there. They had either fake guns or nothing. So the observation bunker is, well, you, you can't open up the top, but there's a little door in the back with some minifigs running out to fight the, the Americans. And then there's, and then we don't, actually, in real life, they climbed up the west side of the cliff, but we did the east just because it's easier. Yeah. And um, we have a rope and a ladder, which was the two ways they got up. And um, would you like to talk a little bit about the cliff, Jake, since you were on um, that? This cliff is um, is sideways building, but the other side is just bricks on top. And we started with this first base plate, and then we did that base plate, and then that base plate, because they're on the big four base plates, and there's one base plate in the middle. Okay, so you kind of have in sections then, like four major base plate kind of sections, and yeah. do you break it down like that to move it as well? No, that would have been a good idea, but... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looking back, you probably should have. <laughs> yes. We were thinking about doing it, but then we, just building the cliff, ended up not doing it. Okay. And then we can talk about the minifigures. Yeah, yeah. So this is, here, I can pick them up. This is a Ranger minifigure with an M1 pot helmet, sand green torso, shirt, and a rifle. Now, the printing on here is... Is a um, I designed the, it in Photoshop. Wow! And it's um it's a little uh, we, it's actually an address label, and then we use a little bit of like the stuff you use on decals, and we put it on. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. Affordable and cheap, and yeah. it offers like perfect result if you're wanting to go historically rec uh, extremely historically accurate. Mm -hmm. And then we have our German 352nd Division Infantry, which have their I can pick them up. But you've got um, dark bluish gray, and then a Stallenheim, and then this one's got a Luger and a potato masher grenade, which is what it, they, which was its nickname. And it has a belt, buttons, and then this intricate collar that I had some help designing. And then there's the little eagle and the two pockets, and then on the back it's just his belt. So you added some really cool little details on the uniforms there. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. And then... How did, the, how did the landscaping work for you guys? I like how you've got the different plants and all the different greens. We made it all flat, and then we took it out, and then we put more outlining, and then we made it more trainy, and we made, just made it flat just so we know what it would look like. If you look at the little pictures in there, you could see what it used to be. Oh, I'm knocking that over. If you go to the pic, if it's the picture on the left, far left corner, you can see how it kind of used to be flat. And then we added in like black and gray to hold it up and then we just kind of did it as we went and then there's the trench which we d designed around and then the various gun um the various places where bombs and shells hit so the craters right okay and then what was the the rock work like on the outside here how did that work what kind of pieces did you use we used lots of the, the big pieces okay. of the two types since we have excess of those and they're easy to come upon right, right. because they come in lots of city sets and then for this one it's actually just a bunch of sideways building that we used and then a little bit of upside building for this one and then for the other side it's just layer various layers of bricks that stacked on top that go in conjuncture with our big, big ugly building <laughs> okay. and then we just built, and then we built a hill in there, so these two are kind of like built in for protection. Yeah, I really like that. And you've even got some, you got some photos here from the real locations. Is that the, the real location there? Yeah, that's the real location. That's an overhead view, what it looks like today. Some rangers fighting on the beach, on a painting, an artist rendering. What, what the gun bunker that we built there looks like today. So that's what it really, and then some rangers climbing up the cliff. And then the pictures on the other side, those are us on location, so that's one of the gun bunkers, and that's us inside a bunker. 
There you go. Yeah, on top of the bunker. I love it. That's really neat that you guys were able to actually go to this location and, and see it. Two times. Okay. So. Two times. There's this little thing about and more in detail than what the mock card shows of what it is. Mm -hmm. And then okay. we got the medic. We got one medic on the mock. Nope, two. Oh, two medics. There's a German medic back there. And was the was the bunker design hard for you guys? Like getting the gun to fit in there and everything? How did that work? It wasn't no, that hard. I designed it more around the gun, and I designed the gun personally myself, and I had to copy it. So it's the exact same pieces. So what we did was we designed a bunker, and then we copied it okay. piece by piece. Yeah, that makes sense. So then you could just kind of replicate it for the second one. Yeah. That way, there's two bunker, there's two guns ready to fire upon Omaha. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is very neat. I appreciate both of you tell, talking me through it and telling us about the build here. I think it turned out really nice. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ainan, and uh, I'm here at the 0937 community event in Paredes de Cora. And I have made a naval display showing a naval battle during the Second World War between the U.S. Navy and the Japanese Navy. I have over there the USS Missouri, the USS Enterprise, the famous aircraft carrier, with plenty of uh, fighter planes and bombers below, above the, the main deck. You can see the Missouri opening fire against the Japanese battleships uh, and cruisers. And over there, over here we have the USS Texas. I built the Texas for a friend of mine, uh, Todd. It's another uh, American Eiffel who asked me to build his ship, this ship for, for his son. To, his name is Austin, and I also have here a Gearing destroyer, the famous USS Indianapolis, the ship, the ship that was uh, sunk by a Japanese torpedo during the Second World War. They are currently making a, a video about the, the film. And over there, we have the Japanese ships. That ship is a submarine, uh, it's a battleship based on the Yamato but with more guns. It was for another display that was going to exhibit here, but was postponed. And we have a, an I-400 submarine, which is an aircraft carrier, which uh, carries some, uh, which is a submarine that can carry planes. And that's it, pretty much. A lot of time and effort that I spent it here. It was really fun to build these ships. My favorite ship here is the USS Missouri here, which I uh, spend a huge quantity of uh, dark blue parts. I try to put as much details as possible, showing the anti-aircraft guns and uh, the camouflage that the ship had at the end of the Second World War. The hull is always the most difficult part to, to do. Uh, initially, I used the wedge bricks to make the, the ships, the hull, like so. It was very smooth and sturdy, but the shape is not the best one. So right now I'm making the transition to, uh, to a hole made with uh, plates, like so. It gets the shape better and it's, uh, the effect is much smoother. It's a lot better, in my opinion. <laughs> how, how do you transport these uh, conventions? Like well, that's a huge problem for me because the Japanese ships were made some years ago when I had plenty of room, but now I don't. So all the ships from the, uh, the American ships can be divided in two parts by just removing some plates here and there. The main hull can be divided in two parts and it's easier to store them at my home, at my parents' home, because I don't have enough room in my own ho house. What inspired you to start building military models like this? Okay, uh, it was uh, like 10 years ago. I was 17 at the time. Um, my father finally put the internet at my house. And so I went in the internet to search for Lego. And first, I, I always thought that I was the only one playing with Lego. And then I put Lego military. And the first page that uh, appeared was the Brick Mania from Daniel Siskin. And I talked a little about, uh, with him and he told me that I should go to mock pages, brick shelf and all the other web pages full of uh, stuff about Lego and everything started there. It's all thanks to Daniel Siskin 
that I'm currently the Eiffel that I am. I'm Jesse Moeller. Uh, I go by Jesse's Brick Galaxy online and uh, I've done a build called uh, The Great Escape. It's the iconic scene where Steve McQueen jumps his motorcycle over uh, barbed wire. So I acquired a lot of Lego barbed wire. It is Lego pieces. And uh, it's the famous German uh, scene, you know, where they're uh, escaping the POW camp. Now, what prompted you to build this scene? Just a big fan of the movie, or was there a particular thing that, that prompted you to start work on this? I am a big fan of the movie um, and the motorcycle, actually. So I, I own a Triumph Bonneville, uh, and uh, that's the you know brand name of that. It's a really nice street bike. Mm -hmm. And as you were working on this, did you just work off screenshots from the movie? Um, yeah, definitely uh, printed a screenshot, and that's how I do my mocks for instructions. You know, you take a photo, print it out, and do the best you can. And for this one, um, the background was a big part of it. You know, it's kind of two pieces where I've got a mosaic with the Swiss Alps behind uh, the barbed wire, you know, so he has somewhere to escape to. <laughs> exactly. So you got kind of that forced perspective there. Did you have to kind of mess around with that a lot to get that to look right, kind of figure out how, you know, micro you wanted the background there with the main scene? A little bit, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's freestyle. Uh, I haven't done many mosaics, so starting with just some simple clouds and mountains seemed uh, doable, and uh, I like the way it turned out. And you mentioned those barbed wire pieces. Are those difficult to get a hold of? I, I can't remember what all sets exactly those came in. 
Yeah, it, it was probably an old Indiana Jones set where they gave you three pieces. So it's definitely like over a dollar on BrickLink for, uh, for one piece of barbed wire. And uh, it's just an, a hoop, so I, you know, I wanted it to spiral, so I've got Lego string kind of twisting it and making it look uh, menacing. <laughs> Yeah, I think it works really well. And then for the minifigs here, are those some custom decals or custom minifigs for the Germans? Custom uh, custom German uh, uh, printed guys from Brickmania. So uh, I've been uh, working around Brickmania. I was in a Lego train club, and then now I'm uh, running their road store. So uh, I did have this mock at a World War Brick and uh, was lucky enough to get an award for it. Um, they gave me kind of a funny pun award. It was the over the top award <laughs> for the motorcycle going over the top. Yeah, very cool. Any plans to build any other scenes from the movie at this point? Um, I get a lot of requests that you know they dug trenches underneath, so a, a section view of some tunnels escaping a POW is definitely uh, uh, a project I'd like to do. Thank you. I think the build turned out great. I appreciate you talking with me about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Andrew Beecraft. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Brothers Brick. And this year we're doing a World War II 1949 display. So imagine a world in which Pearl Harbor failed and the Japanese Empire was integrated into an Atlantic Pacific alliance. And the Soviet Union, meanwhile, overran all of Europe, creating the Soviet Reich. So you've got uh, allied mechs on one side with technology continuing to advance over the course of the war. Uh, and you've got German rocketry and uh, mechanized infantry on the other side as well, including a Tesla tank turning Nazis into zombies because a display like this is just screaming for Nazi zombies. So. Uh, World War II 1949, uh, some really fantastic stuff. This is my stuff. I won't call it fantastic, but we have a Canadian maple syrup, radioactive maple syrup powered walking tank. That so sounds that's, very dangerous. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, along with uh, this Normandy beach here that I've recycled from previous years. We've got uh, some uh, great sky fi going on up in the air above with uh, a great plane by Dave Sterling. Uh, another blue and white plane down here by Dave Sterling over here. Uh, some great buildings over there by uh, Sean Edmison. This uh, great walker mech over here by, uh, by Chris Malloy as well. Uh, and I think Eric Wilkinson, I believe, is the one who built this great, fantastic. I'm going to try play features here because this is just freaking fantastic. So fully posable ball turret. Wow, that's awesome. That's fantastic. <laughs> so I'm going to point it at some zombies over here. But these guys are fairly su surprised. I'm actually not sure whether this is allied or not. <laughs> but you can see uh, we've got... Uh, we've got a Japanese allied mech over here, a fantastic mech by Matt Roundtree, I believe, um, with some Soviets coming in over here as well. Now, don't miss the fact that we have a few superheroes mixed in as well with uh, this dude, Wolverine, who is Canadian, by the way, according to the mythology, uh, Captain America and the Howling Commandos, along with the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Superheroes in real life. There you go. So, moving on to slightly stranger things, we have the uh, Tesla tank by uh, Chris Malloy and myself with a Soviet KV-1 hull with a Tesla turret by Chris and a bunch of zombies getting created, which is how we're explaining the fact that they have yellow hands, because really yellow hands are kind of hard to come by. Uh, some great uh, mercenary mechs in the middle here, uh, whose name escapes me, uh, by Christian Benito. Great. There's, that's, what we, that's why we have mock cards. That's right. Um, and one guess as to which Lego creation uh, a little further forward is by Guy Himber. 
Oh, I can only imagine. I'm going to guess it's that right there. <laughs> yes, precisely. So Guy Hember can bling anything. And in that case, that's a Renault FT from World War I. Right. So we'll, we'll give him a pass because he's Guy Hember. So I also stuck a uh, Rogue One tank in the middle here because it actually kind of, kind of fits. Uh, Kalen Malloy built this... Uh, V5 rocket, because imagine, you know, in 1949, the, uh, the uh, world would have continued advancing. We've got Werner von Braun entering his bunker here. And I, let me show you guys some cool stuff inside here. So we've got 1940s era computer banks. Uh, double doors for blast purposes, a viewing port for the uh, for the rocket. I don't know that I would want to live in that beautiful house by Sean Edmison over there, uh, given that it's right next to the rocket. But it is a very beautiful house. It is. That, that's a yeah. I really like the way he did the the kind of white and black blending of the the walls and everything that design on that building. Yes, indeed, and it goes very well with a rocket right next to it. <laughs> it does. <laughs> so moving on, we have. Uh, a flying wing, also by Chris Malloy, uh, who proves that Lego can make some fairly nasty symbolism here. Uh, we do not approve or condone, but for something set in a World War II that never ended, it's historically accurate, I guess. Don't, don't judge me. Don't judge Chris either. I think that's asking too much from YouTube commenters. Yeah, probably <laughs> so. Bring it on. All right, so this is uh, Kalen's farm, which is the third time we have recycled this section. <laughs> Last year, uh, we talked about our Civil War display. And so this is, a, uh, this is a Civil War display that we just turned around and put some bomb craters in, along with some pigs. Uh, and, so, and a great little mech there that Chris pumped out with some spare. Uh, we had two gallon bags of gray and managed to find some cool stuff that... Uh, that turned into a decent mech. Uh, bonus points to anybody who can spot the one piece of mega block in that. In what, that. what would make you do such a thing? It was actually kind of a cool piece. It makes, <laughs> now I need to go tell him and take a shower, but, but uh, we'll be fine. Uh, and then up above, we've got a really, really fantastic glider that Chris built. Uh, super, super hyper-realistic, except that you would never jump out of a glider. Um, that's okay. But it's a really, really fantastic glider. Now, the, the support is actually kind of interesting. It is a 100-year-old tractor axle from uh, TBB co-founder Josh Whedon's farm, <laughs> or, or as we call it, the post-apocalyptic compound. So uh, this, is, uh, this is how Chris supports his airplane with a... Uh, 50 pound, 100 year old tractor axle. Wow. <laughs> uh, which then brings us to the end of the display with a really great command tent by Sean Edmison and a s bunch of destroyed mechs by Justin Pratt. He has a very fiddly mech that has fallen down, and I'm sorry you don't get to see it on YouTube, but I'm sure there will be videos and photos of it elsewhere. Any questions? Oh, this is super impressive. One thing I noticed here along with the plane is this kind of brick-built parachute, which I think is kind of neat. I, I like that technique. Yes, uh, using Bram Sphere, Lowell Sphere, something like that, uh, sort of studs out technique. Yeah, very, very cool stuff rather than, you know, taking a piece of cloth and cutting it, but a proper brick-built parachute. I think that's fantastic. And one thing that's always interesting with collaborations is kind of how you guys communicate before setup and everything and as you're building on it, how did that work in figuring out who did what section and how it was all going to fit together? Our secret is anarchy. <laughs> so in our case, we, we kind of intentionally choose not to dictate standards or, or you know, too many ideas beforehand. Right. And we like to see how it comes together at the at the convention. Last year was very much an exception where we said, okay, we're going to use the brick plus plate standard and it, we're going to have a green hill and we recruited specific people but typically we don't do that and uh, this is the result of uh, an instance where we literally did no active recruiting of, of specific builders and we did no active planning either 
So it came together quite nicely for something where we intentionally chose not to do any planning. Yeah, it did. Well, that's, that's really impressive. I think it came together really well. Thanks for talking to me about it. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Keep up the good work, guys. Hey there, Joshua Hanlon here, and today I'm in Evansville and joined by Lando from Brickmania. You might recognize him from his many appearances on the Brickmania YouTube channel, some of the wonderful talent they have over there in their video production. Always great. Always good to see you there. So he's going to talk us through some of these minifigs that Brickmania has produced here and kind of the design process with these. Uh, I guess the first step that I, I, I try to start with is a sketch, honestly. Um, the computer's really cool for um, making them really straight lines. But I think often uh, a lot of the character of, of, of a design um, on almost anything, honestly, it, it can be lost if you if you don't base it on some sort of physical process. And I really I, so I really try to start off with a, with a sketch, at least a basic sketch. Um, one, it kind of helps me um, plan out where I'm going to place all the different um, gear and pieces and belts and zippers and stuff on a minifigure. Um, two, it also kind of um, it lets me just play around with different designs and um, just kind of flesh out ideas. And it's, it's a lot faster than trying to just create it all on the computer. Mm -hmm. So that's my very first step. Um, from there, I mean, it, it's I'll scan those uh, drawings into the computer and I'll use a program, uh, Adobe Illustrator. Mm -hmm. And um, and that that's kind of the, my end of the process. I'll send that off to the print shop. I got some really talented guys uh, working at Brickmania that print these uh, really cool figures that I've had a, a lot of fun designing. So, so you do that all in house at Brickmania. Then is this whole process done at Brickmania? Yeah, this is this is all des um, designed and printed at Brickmania. Um, obviously, we have to buy the um, base Lego pieces um, just on through Bricklink is our primary source of that. Um, Lego doesn't have any official deal with that, so we're actually buying all these parts um, just you know the stock price for that. Um, some of them, like it's hard actually finding quantities of blank minifigures. So it's actually uh, it's actually cheaper to um, buy buy some printed minifigures, and we'll buff we'll, we'll yeah we'll buff those off, um, and um, yeah we'll just we have a guy in the back just sanding them down, and <laughs> it's kind of so yeah it's it's funny the, the same um, sa automotive sandpaper that um, that you use for like shining up um, car car lights like the head the headlights on cars. Um, we, yeah, that's, that's, uh, we can use that to, to make just a fresh surface for the, for printing on it. And then from there we're using a UV cured, um, resin based, uh, ink with that. So it's, it's a full color. It's really cool. It's, it's actually more durable than pad printing. Um, it's, yeah, which I, I love pad printing. I think pad printing has a, has a really rich uh, look to it, really crisp colors. Um, and that's what, that's what Lego uses, right? Um, but there's, there's, um, there's a lot more flexibility with this method, and and it's it's more durable actually. So mm -hmm. that's amazing. So you're able to get it even higher quality than Lego with that stuff. Oh, or just different quality, right? right? Um, I mean, the durability thing is really awesome, but I mean, if you're trying to scratch Lego, you're you know you're you're trying to ruin it, right? Yeah. I, th I think I think pad printing holds up really well, just just as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you can then maybe take us through each of these minifigs, talk about some of the different you know design elements on them and kind of how these how these particular minifigs came together for you. For, uh, for sure. Uh, let's maybe start off with the deck, uh, the deck crewman. So the guy in blue. Um, that's one of my most recent designs here. Um, so this is a modern U.S. Navy deck crew off of an air, aircraft carrier. We're actually planning on building, um, Dan's going to build this mega carrier. It's a WASP class carrier. Um, so that's going to be one of our largest builds that we're going to ever attempt here um, thus far. So uh, kind of kind of starting that off, we wanted to create the the crewmen, and there, there's just these really iconic uh, deck crewmen. They're all they're all in different colors. It's really just vibrant. Um, it's 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 interesting seeing that much color um, just in the military space. So that's kind of cool. And he's wearing a uh, camouflage pants. That's actually um, um, that's woodland camouflage, um, a brand new. Uh, iteration of that so woodland's been around since like the um oh gosh it dates back to like the 70s um maybe it, maybe the 80s in this version um is when it really got popular um but the navy guys still use that on the, on the decks of uh the aircraft carriers so i think that thought that was kind of cool um i guess what else um he's got a texture printed helmet so check, check that out that's another thing that you can't really not that i know of you can't do that with pad printing um with with digital UV cured ink, you can actually build up layers of that um, to create textures like that. Which um, you know we're trying to there, there are these uh, crash pads on the, on this helmet that protect them from impact and stuff. So 
um, or using that ink in that manner. And that's that's a custom part by um, Minifig Cat is that that's helmet and that headset on there. So we're using a few custom parts, um, aftermarket parts. And that's uh, always a big part of a lot of the, the Minifig uh, you know, brick mania minifigs, right? That yeah. you're kind of combining. You've got brick arms, weapons, and things, and so you do some of the work, you know, the printing yourself. But then all these accessories and things kind of come from other places, right? I mean, obviously, we try and use Lego as much as possible. Um, we we love Lego, so that's the starting point always, whenever possible. Um, sometimes you just can't get quantities of something that you'd like, um, and sometimes it just really doesn't exist. So uh, that's especially like military helmets. Um, um, that's where, so we, we always, we try, we try to use brick arms. We love brick arms. That's our favorite, but there are other brands that do some, make some pretty crazy, awesome stuff too. So yeah, uh, moving on, I have a world war two U S army MP. I just picked him out cause I thought he was a really sharp looking kind of late war uniform. Um, just showing off just printing on all, all the different surfaces. Um, and I just thought he looked cool. So I pulled them out of the, out of our display case. Mm -hmm. The uh, white helmet there with the printing on front it looked, yeah. is very nice. Yeah, it really pops. I, th I thought that was a slick looking uniform and it turned into one of my favorite um, minifigures here and just white gloves, white helmet and those white uh, leg wraps. Just uh, I thought it looked cool. So, yeah. Uh, moving on, here's one of my oh, this, this figure turned out really popular. Um, this is a World War Two U.S. Uh, sergeant and he's got texture printing on that brick arms right there. Um, so I, I don't know if you're how familiar you everyone is with brick arms, but um, it's just custom aftermarket weaponry designed to go with Lego. Um, and they have these they have a series called overmolded stuff and and it's it's um, it's like a two part injection process and it's actually pretty complicated and it ends up creating a really um, like it's a beautiful weapon, but it's 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 expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so with this process, I'm at, we're actually printing on the weapons. So you're taking a stock brick arms, which um, you know you can get for like a buck or so, and by printing on it, you can get a very similar look and you know even additional detail. So, um, and then um, also some more things to note about the printing process on this figure. Uh, if you want to check out the face, he's got a texture printed cigar. I don't know how good the lighting is on that. Um, but uh, that cigar is sticking out a little bit out of his head, and that's been incredibly popular um, on that figure. And it just, it's just, it's it's fun to try out these different texture processes that um, you just you, you just can't really find that in the in the stock Lego world. Mm -hmm. Is uh, that is that harder to print on things like you know you see the side of the arm there or the face you know I, versus just the kind of the normal torso printing? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, being a curved surface, uh, it does add some complexity to it. Uh, so we have to make custom jigs uh, to hold it in place on the printers. And a, a funny note, a, a lot of the jigs that we actually use are just actually made out of Lego. Uh, so because Lego is, a, is um, for its cost, a really cheap, um, like you can use it for like kind of these commercial or uh, industrial purposes to uh, like hold making jigs and, and uh, just all sorts of stuff like that. Because it's got really great tolerances. Um, so you can hold stuff in the same space like place every single time so um yeah and that's the, so that's the uh, world war ii u.s sergeant uh, moving on we have a modern u.s army rifleman and that's in that um it's that brand new camouflage pattern uh, that the uh, u.s military has been using uh, it's based uh heavily on multi-cam um, i believe they call it the operational camouflage pattern and um and that was a real real challenge um i've been i've been working for years to try and get this camouflage pattern right um, and I've probably had maybe three or four different versions of it prior to this um, that I wasn't quite happy with it. And I think I've finally landed on something that that I'll call OK for now. <laughs> but no, I, I, there's I, always room for improvement. You're always trying to kind of make the designs better and, and see what you can do to, to further the printing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, and it's always fun to just like you're, you might be happy with something for now, but something else will inspire you you'll, or you'll, you'll think of a different way of doing it. And um, you go from there. And so, yeah, it, nothing's ever, ever really um, the perfect version. I don't, I don't think, I mean, maybe at that time it's, it's, it's your favorite one or it's the coolest one you've made thus far, but then looking back, it's like, oh man, that was kind of primitive compared to, you know, what I could, what I can do now. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy with this one for the moment, but we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, so that's just the, uh, that's just a modern U S army rifleman, um, decked out in some brick arms gear, uh, and just ammo pouches printed on there. And so I try and, I try and find as many reference pictures as possible before, um, creating a design, and um, you know, National Archives has has a wealth of different uh, different pictures and photographs from the military. So that's been super helpful, especially for the World War II stuff. Um, but even into the modern stuff, you can you can just kind of pick apart all the different gear that they're wearing. I'll try and track down the exact boots and everything, and and just as much as I can find the names and everything of it. 
that uh, kind of research aspect is that is that how big of a part of your job is that is that something you pretty much all do yourself or is there other people who help with that and then kind of feed you that info for designs um i guess i guess it's a bit of a team effort um for the most part uh you know the Obviously, Wikipedia is a great starting spot. You know, I'll be honest; it's a it's a good starting yeah. spot. Um, but from there, Dan has an extensive library uh, of all of his tanks, and he does have quite a few books based on uh, just uh, talking about uniforms and weaponry. Um, so that's been really awesome, just kind of having that resource. Mm -hmm. um, and even Dan's pretty knowledgeable in all this stuff. Um, as far as, as uniforms go, um, yeah, uh, those those books have been incredibly helpful. Um, different online sources and and watching watching various films and, and footage and just yeah I, I love I love beautiful old pictures from from back during uh, World War two and you know earlier in World War one stuff it's, it's, there's some gorgeous pictures that I'll use for reference on different minifigures so sure. um, yeah and then again again from there um, so the, yeah this one what we're looking at right now is the uh, female sniper so that's lady death is what they referred to her as um, and she was a famous sniper back during World War World War II, she had some of the highest kills of the war. Uh, that's who she's based off of. And uh, that's a really, really interesting camo. It's it's called the ami amoeba camo pattern, camouflage pattern. I don't know how they would have called it in Russian, but um, so that, that was kind of one of the one of an, an earlier camouflage patterns um, developed at the time. And it really, it, it's just a bunch of splatters on <laughs> on these uniforms. <laughs> I, I think they were screen printed at the time. I don't think they were actually splattered paint on there, but. Um, yeah, it's just it's 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 interesting that uh, I just love the evolution of camouflage patterns. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and then uh, moving on, the last figure I pulled out here uh, would be the modern PMC operator, and that's just like a private military uh, contractor is what that would be, um, employed by various militaries across the world, um, just kind of fighting unofficial battles and whatnot. Um, often, you know, there's the stereotypes of these are just these are the the, the private military owned by oil companies and whatnot so kind of a um i have them i have a logo on the arm you might be familiar with that um so it's it's uh we didn't call it octan that's the lego brand it's moctan moc <laughs> right so that's our own that's our own private military military contractors the moctan corporation so, well with the, the stereotype there <laughs> yeah a little bit of a spoof there <laughs> i i like how it, uh, moctan recent or octan has been rebranding themselves as a uh environmentally friendly company but i think we know better we know their we know their origins <laughs> this is the beginning of like the brick mania video game here where you're like as a, pr a private military contractor oh we definitely yeah i've been i've been thinking of all, all these ideas in my head about this uh this sub brand of yeah, anyway yeah <laughs> we'll see we'll see private military contractor sponsored by big oil right big abs i guess right yeah cool um so I guess minifigure design has been a, a, a ton of fun here at Brickmania. Um, I've really been enjoying this this whole process of kind of bringing these creations to life um, and kind of in, interpreting what I what I see in real life off of my soldiers into a minifig form. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, that's what. What do you find are the differences between kind of designing for a minifig versus maybe other design projects you've done over the years on you know variety of areas? What is kind of makes minifig design special at the scale and everything? I guess I guess the first thing that comes to mind uh, with minifigures versus um, something like a kit, let's say, mm -hmm. um, minifigures are they're, they're, they're figures, they're human forms, right? And I think people instantly have a, a connection with that, um, and and you can kind of relate to a minifigure. Whereas as, as cool as tanks are, you don't re really relate to a tank as well, right? <laughs> uh, at least most of us don't. I don't. I don't know. Um, but uh, so that I think just minifigures, they're just fun. They're they're little characters um, that have just so much personality. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and these are fantastic designs. So great work, Lando. I think you've definitely gotten better at these over the years. I'm sure, and I think it definitely shows. So thank you for for bringing these out to the show, and I'm glad you could give us some insight into this process. Look forward to seeing more figs from you in the future. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to talk to you guys, and you know, I uh, I really enjoy Beyond the Brick. So it's it's thank you.